Are you tired of the same old pro wrestling? Then check out the amazing action on Powerslam.tv, the biggest indie pro wrestling channel in the world. Get over 4,000 hours of the best pro wrestling events from over 110 of the biggest names in the industry from over 15 countries around the globe. Get your free trial today at powerslam.tv. The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Hey, what's up? This is Jeff Cobb, and you're listening to Keep It A Strong Style. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, keeping it strong style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, keeping it strong style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Barrio the Frost. From Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is the network where we can get it done. I'm a chiller. And let them have it Cause this is just an intro Keeping the strong style Six stars from the get go Boy Yeah from Tampa Bay To the Tokyo Dome This is keeping it strong style With your host Jeremy Donovan And the young boy Joshua Smith And thank you for listening Welcome to Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Jeremy Donovan here with the young boy Josh Smith. On today's show, we'll be reviewing New Japan Road, previewing King of Pro Wrestling, answering your questions, and covering all latest news in the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling. You can support our show by subscribing to the Social Suplex Podcast Network on the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating and review. You can also get all the podcasts and columns over at socialsuplex.com. This episode of Keeping a Strong Style is brought to you by Power Slam TV. Power Slam TV is an independent wrestling streaming service with over 5,000 hours of wrestling from companies across the world. Use the promo code SOCIALSUPLEX to get your first month free of that service. Make sure you check out our Pro Wrestling Tees store, prowrestlingtees.com slash socialsuplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong Style t-shirt. All right, young boy. How you doing, man? I'm doing fantastic, man. I just uh, I want to say um, that was an incredible intro. Thank I, I, I like the way you, uh, you you felt the music, you felt the vibe, and you're like, welcome, <laughs> keeping it strong style, <laughs> different different tone, different vibe on this rainy uh, Monday evening. Yeah, rainy Monday Monday here in uh, Tampa, Florida. Yeah, the dojo is quiet this evening. But it's filled with the love of our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> it's filled with the love of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Yo, are you? Uh, do you want to like talk about Hell in a Cell at all? <laughs> I, I, I'd rather not. <laughs> oh man, dude! <laughs> Yesterday we had like the biggest like group call I think we've ever had. After, I wasn't on it. I know you were on it. After, it was like eight of us on the group call after Hell in a Cell just. All of us just in disbelief and just frustrated and all what happened at the end of that show. Yeah, man, it was a good show. <laughs> don't, 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 don't do, <laughs> James Boyd. Don't, don't do this. <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> all I know is at the end of that show, I sat there and I thought to myself, "It's time to start a dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have a discussion." Yeah, well, we're not going to have that dialogue here. Cause Why? We're, Inquiring minds want to know. We want to talk about good pro wrestling. We don't want to talk about great pro wrestling. We want to talk about the king of pro wrestling, New Japan. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, the king you, of pro wrestling, Minoru Suzuki. <laughs> I think well, we're going to be talking about him yeah, today. Yeah, we're talking a lot about Suzuki today. Uh, but if you want to hear, you know, Hell in a Cell talk, I believe, One Nation Radio, they're actually, I think they're actually recording right now also. So, uh, You know what? I'm more excited to hear... Ricky and Clive's take on this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're going to bury that. So, I well, I they they always have a unique take on things, which I appreciate. I don't know, since we turned Ricky on to this, <laughs> this new Japan, he he's been uh, I feel like his patience has been thin with uh, WWE lately. That's probably to a degree true, but at the same time, uh I like I like that they have a balanced take on things and unique from everybody else. They, they they're not, you know, just Defense bots, they're out here, like, give, giving their heart and they're giving their soul, just like as we all do here on uh, Social Suplex. But By the way, no one's really mentioned this. Over 100,000 downloads. 
for the Social Suplex Podcast Network, and that that's freaking crazy. That dates back to you know the origins of One Nation Radio starting. That kind of rolls into our numbers, and yeah, man, big things are happening. Uh, you know, the five year anniversary of Social Suplex. I believe it's next week, and you know we're uh, we're planning some stuff, man. We're going to be changing some stuff towards the end of the year. Um, something that the listeners have been wanting for a while, and uh, we're going to make things you know a little bit easier for you guys as far as. Subscribing to the, this network and all your favorite shows, so kind of stay tuned for what we got planned down in the future. I can't wait to figure out what it is that we got planned. <laughs> Y'all keep me in the dark. <laughs> hey, man, it all happens in the group. The group is for that, man. Oh God, I can't listen. That group chat. No, the the, the four like the tra- the chat with me, you, uh, Rich, and James. Oh, the executive VP chat. The, the, yeah, the executive chat. Yeah. <laughs> Those of you that don't know, we're all co executive VPs. <laughs> <laughs> Of it. So, yeah. And, then, you know, our uh, 100th episode, we are three weeks away from episode 100 with our special guest interview. That'll kick off that show. If we're all co executive VPs, like, am I like, uh, I'm probably like Nick Jackson. I'm the least, like, I'm the one who's making the least <laughs> amount of decisions. <laughs> would, you, would you think that Nick Nick's lower than Matt? Matt's definitely involved. Bro, Nick, Nick, like, wore, like, tennis shoes and a suit. <laughs> like, this man, he wasn't even fitted. Like, that's me. Like, he doesn't know what's going on. He shows up and he, he does the work. Oh, Nick's man. not a decision maker. You know what Nick's good at? Working the crowds. And they don't even have him working, like, you know, working, like, all the, like, uh, all the marks on Twitter and stuff. That's what he likes to do. That's yeah. me. The freaking troll of the group. Oh, man. All right, man. So let's and, uh, and he's losing his hair, and I might be losing my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all need to talk to Jericho, man. Yeah, he brought it back, huh? Yeah, yeah. Just you know, magically, I don't know where. Speaking of which, have you watched the Eric Andre show? No. Oh my god, you gotta, watch, bro. You have to watch. I don't know if you would like it, but I I freaking love it. It's like this uh, show on Adult Swim. It's not Hulu. You should watch it. But they uh, it's basically like a troll. Late night television show, like I don't know, it's it's insane. Like they just literally fuck with the people that come on there. And uh, I was watching this weekend. There's episode of Jericho, <laughs> <laughs> and they bring him out, and Jericho like sits down, and Eric Andre's. It's Hannibal Burris, you know Hannibal. Yeah, Burris. Mm-hmm. it's him and Eric Andre, and they're both like comedians. They just literally mess with people. And he's like, "Uh, you're 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 a wrestler. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> tell us how you got your style." <laughs> and he like his head's just shaking. He keeps saying that, and then Hannibal Burris starts foaming from the mouth and like Jericho's just looking around like what the fuck is happening <laughs> and then like his table opens up and a li- a beam of light comes through it and smoke starts like sh- like shining through it and they're both like rolling their eyes in the back of their head like shaking around and Jericho doesn't know he doesn't say anything Jericho's just like so confused <laughs> and then he gets up and tries to walk away and then the floor breaks from underneath him and he <laughs> falls through the floor wow and then it, and then it goes like we'll be right back <laughs> And then they never bring him back. <laughs> like he doesn't say a single word on the show. Like I don't even know how they got him to agree to like release it. It's Dude, that that's crazy. It's freaking hilarious. Yeah, I'm gonna have to check that out. We don't know if he'll be back on Eric Andre's show. We don't know if he'll be back in New Japan Pro Wrestling. We'll, we'll, we'll be talking about the latest on Jericho and New Japan in the news. But we'll uh, see. but first we have to talk about this riveting New Japan Road Show that happened today from Cork and Hall. Man, hell of a show. What do you mean? So it's road to what? It's New Japan Road. To what? That's the name of the show. It's New Japan Road. Oh, God. <laughs> so. I mean, technically, it's a road to King of Pro Wrestling, but it's not. No, it's it's not. It's <laughs> not. So you got your you got your A shows. You know, you got your King of Pro Wrestlings. You know, your, well, no, you got like your Dominion and your Wrestle Kingdom and maybe like G1 Final. Then you got like your B shows, which is kind of like. Sakura Genesis. I would even say like King of Pro Wrestling at this point is like in there. Yeah. You know? Then you got like your C shows, like your you know, your Cork and Hall main events, things like that. And then you got your D shows. We're talking, you know, Lionsgate Project and then Road Two. Not Road to anything in particular, just Road Two. <laughs> King of Pro Wrestling was so embarrassed by this show that they didn't even want their name associated with it. They're like they're like Road Two, eh eh eh. It's just road. <laughs> <laughs> just that's how you, that's how you know that you are watching the lowest of the low when it comes to New Japan yeah. wrestling. They don't even, they don't even associate it with their big show. No, you you know, you know how it's low. It's low when you you pop open the Grapple app and there's literally nobody. 
that has logged <laughs> star ratings in. I am as as of this recording, I am the only person that has logged star ratings for New Japan Road. Okay, in all fairness though, um it's only been a few hours, but still No, that, but that normally normally when I, yeah. when I log on there, like there's at least like twenty to forty for a Monday show. One week from now, when King of Pro Wrestling comes over under, how many reviews is that show gonna have? Oh, it's gonna have like two hundred. By that time, you think 200 Grapple users will have... No, I'm saying oh, Road. Oh, oh, New Japan Road? Yeah. Oh. By the time next week comes around, we record. How many... Like, what's the over-under? 20? Dude. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're going to be under that. Yeah. It, I, I might set those... I might I might take those odds, set it lower. <laughs> yeah. My God, no one's watching this. Yeah. I don't I don't think the other uh, New Japan and Pro podcasts that are out there... I, like, I don't think Dave Meltzer's going to talk about this shit. Like, no one's well, going to... It's just us. I do know that Muzza watched it because he spoiled one of the matches for me <laughs> by uh, changing his nickname in the group uh, chat. But Muzza, always bringing great... Stay, stay, stay spoiling. He, he stays <laughs> contributing to this show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, anyway. So, New Japan Road from Cork and Hall. Kick things off. We had uh, Satoshi Kojima, Hiroshi Tenzan, and Yuya Yamura defeating Yuji Nagata. Nobu Nakanishi and Yota Suji in the opener. Uh, this was a pretty good opener. It's your, you know, your normal standard, you know, New Japan opener. New Japan dads teaming with Young Lions. You know, we have uh, Umino and Narita. They're on excursion now. So um, Suji and Yumura, they're kind of like the kind of the seniors now, as far as the Japanese Young Lions go, and they're in their uh, their fight for ever rivalry, and we saw that kind of continue here. Yeah, um, it leaves us in a bit of a precarious situation where, like, we've we've been low on young lions, not low on them, but low in numerical means, meaning like th- that people have got, you know gotten called up and gone on excursion. But I can't remember the last time there was only two, you know, Japanese young lions in the company, and um, that's where we're at. So I'm wondering if we've got some young lions on the horizon that might be making their debut soon. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm sure we will. we have to. So I'm not sure of it because I mean it's it's tough to get into that dojo system. So right, um, you know I haven't seen any like anybody like helping out or anything. So right, I don't know. and you know, there has been some uh, some tryouts I think that happened the last couple of months for both set of dojos. So you're right, that's yeah. true. So so there is a chance we got more people coming, but. Yes, Suji and Yumura are at the top of the top of the heap. Yep, and so this match came down with uh, Kojima and Tenzon hitting the uh, Ten Koji Cutter, and then Tenzon applying that Anaconda device onto Suji to get the win here for their team. P- pretty standard, lots of fun. It's what you expect when you see you know the the dads team up with the Lions. And uh, you know the Corkin crowd was pretty behind it. Yeah, it's, yeah, they're they're pretty lively. You know, I would I would go a smidge under three stars, maybe three stars. I don't know, I was right around that range. Yeah, it's around the three star range. It's good match. Yep. So then we move on. We had Shingo Takagi defeating Toa Hanare nine minutes and forty five seconds, and I really enjoyed this match. This was a very good, um, you know, second card match right here, and it's almost kind of like um, it wasn't as good as Hanare and Ishii. Maybe if it had more time, but it's still kind of the same kind of setup with Shingo controlling most of the match and then Toa kind of getting some hope spots and coming back. There was a huge headbutt that Toa hit on Shingo, mm, yeah. and, and it pissed Shingo off, and he just came back and just murdered this kid. Yeah, this didn't have the same backstory that uh, Hanare and Ishii had last year going into it because that was such a prolonged, built-up thing. Um, and I think still the... the um, Chemistry between Hanari and Ishii probably rivals this one or even outdoes it. But mm. this was a really good showcase for Hanari. It's the, you know, we haven't gotten one for from him since probably the match we were just talking about, really. Right, yeah. Um, the only other, like, singles match I can really, well, he had a match with Ishii this year in Australia, and it, it was nothing like was their not, other matches. Yeah, not the same energy. And then he had a match with, um, with Big Trent early in the year when Trent first came in and, you know, uh, came back from injury and, Neither guy looked very good in that. So this was kind of it was nice to see the the company give a vote of confidence in Hanari, but all also at the same time like you knew what this was. Right. This match was set up strictly for Shingo to get over to kind of rebound after the loss from Goto. 
um, to get him back in the winning ways, and that's exactly what happened here. Shingo hit a pumping bomber, and then they made it in Japan to pin Torhanara, get the victory, and kind of move on. Yeah, I thought that this was a very good, hard-hitting match. Um, I thought they got a good amount of time, just under 10 minutes. And um, <clears throat> it, it is very telling, though, that he beat him with the Made in Japan because he's not beating most of the the, um, the the top guys. The top guys with this. It's more of a secondary finish for him. So I like that he's beating people with it, but he's beating people the likes of Rocky Romero, you know, juniors, things like that. And so for him to beat a, a Hanari with it, that kind of tells you where they see Hanari here. Right. Do you think that this did um, any favors for Hanari? Or do you think that this is just solidifying his role as being cannon fodder? What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of in the middle because, you know, clearly, I mean, it's Shingo, man. Like, there's, right. there's no way Hanara's getting a win over Shingo. Um, yeah, I think Hanara is kind of in that weird gray space right now where he's not a young lion. He's not really a mid-carter. He's kind of like a, you know, curtain jerker job guy. That's going to get some offense. He's going to have some hope spots, some near falls. But at the end of the day, you know he's there to take the take the pinfall. And, I mean, he looked really good in the match. But good. I just don't know what's the what's the game plan for Hanare. How long is he going to be in this role? Is he stuck in this role? Or is there going to be one random show where he gets an upset win over a guy like Shingo, over an Ishii, that eventually elevates him? Well, the interesting thing is, you know, we saw him in that class of young lions around the same time as, like, Kawato. Oak, uh, Kitamura, guys like that, and a lot of the, a lot of his, um, you know, a lot of his peers went off on excursion. He stayed in the company. He got the, um, you know, the, they graduated him to the main roster, but he's just literally been stuck in this one position. And while he's been stuck in that position, they haven't elevated him. And at the same time, they've brought in a lot of talent. Shingo being one of them. Obviously, Shingo is way beyond him already. I mean, there's this isn't uh, an indictment on New Japan for that. That's uh, obviously it's, that's the right decision. But there's so many guys coming into this company that are just passing him by, you know. Right. Yeah. And he's kind of like, I don't know. You know, I don't know how much you put onto the performer and say, hey, you need to step it up, or you put on the company and say, hey, you need to book this guy better, or if it's a combination of the two. But he's clearly in this role, and people are passing him by, and. You know, we're about to watch the guys that he was above that just went, you know, Uminos, Maridas, guys like that. They're going to come back, and if he's still here, they're going to pass him up. Right. I mean, even the L.A. Dojo guys, Fredericks, right. Connors, and Coughlin, I mean, those guys are already cooking in, especially Fredericks, you know, with that big, uh, new, uh, excuse me, Young Lions Cup win, and just the way they've been pushing him, like, I could see him coming in and surpassing Hernard. I, I could definitely see that, and... um. One, I, I had one final take on this, but I kind of forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, I thought this was good. Um, you know, I do wonder where we're going with Hanari. I thought this was great to get Shingo back in the win column. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I didn't, even though I liked the match and I was entertained by it, and I don't know if this was the function of the match, but you remember, like, many of those showcase matches that Shoto Umino had? And, like, you knew what the deal was. He was losing. Right, like him against, like, Nagata and Kojima yeah. and stuff like that. Even Shingo. He yeah. had one with Shingo. That's right, yeah, he did. And uh, even Moxley, yeah. in all those matches, you left it feeling like, wow, they're, they've got plans for this guy. I got to tell you, at the end of this, I didn't feel that way about Hanari. No, yeah. I feel like if he's going to be anything, he's going to really have to like edge out a, like a spot for himself based on his work and based on his connection with the crowd, which the truth of the matter is they're both good, but they're both lacking. Yeah, they're not where they should be, and so yeah, I didn't le I didn't leave this match feeling the way I felt about some of those Umino matches. Not saying that that was the function of this match. I don't know if this again, cause this was about Shingo more so than Hanari, but um, you know, this was a good little match. I mean, it reminded me of like what you used to see on like a Monday Night Raw or something like that, like a little crossroads. Um, even kind of similar to like what was on AEW this week with like, you know, that squash with Cutler and MJF. Mm. You know, one guy's clearly not going to win, but it's sort of like a little bit of a showcase. This was essentially like a longer squash match, basically. Yeah, I mean, kind of, I mean, it's maybe more like the uh, the Cody Sammy G match. Oh yeah, because um, clearly they have plans for Sammy G, and they're, they they want to get him over. But but I, but I don't know if they I don't know what the plans are for Nari. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the difference. Thing. Yeah, I don't know what plans they have for him. So, but um, good little match, and I I would give it a recommend three and a half. Yeah, definitely. If you want to check out anything from this show, definitely. It's probably uh, it's one of the best matches on the show. So. Yeah. 
So then we had uh, Tiger Mask and Jushin Liger taking on Suzuki Goon members, Minoru Suzuki and Yoshinobu Kanemaru. And uh, like we predicted last week, uh, we had a, a DQ, uh, this Liger and Suzuki going at each other, and um, eventually Liger kind of snapping towards the end of the match, hitting the referee with the chair. Is this what you got spoiled on? No. Okay, I got spoiled on this. But, yeah. No, I got spoiled on the uh, the never six man. This was in the group chat too. I got spoiled on this. Oh, I I I miss. I must have been early this morning. Yeah, yeah, I missed out. But yeah, so Liger and Suzuki pretty much just brawling throughout the whole match, going after the mask, and then um, towards the end they were kind of doing the dueling chair spot, and then Liger eventually loses it, hits the ref. Ref uh, calls for the DQ. So Suzuki and uh, Kanemaru get the win here by DQ, um, and then they kind of continue to you know kind of brawl post match and. You know, just building up heat for next Monday for King of Pro Wrestling when these guys uh, Bro, finally... it's heated. It's heated. Yeah. Uh, post-match, Liger got on the mic, and he uh, he says, I apologize to everyone to who's coming to Rio Goku Monday because you aren't going to see a wrestling match. You're going to witness a fight to the death, a murder, because oh I promise God. you I will take Suzuki's head. I feel like you might do it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... I feel like I need to prepare myself mentally to like for what we're about to see. Like this yeah. might be uncomfortable. Yeah, Suzuki or excuse me, Liger is not playing around. He's he's over it. He's fed up. He 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 wants Suzuki's head. Well, at least we didn't have to see the demon come out this week. <laughs> Yo, Keishin Liger's scary, bro. <laughs> like I had a nightmare about him. <laughs> uncomfortable. I I was Suzuki and I was up against that table. And he was about to spike me in the head, and then I woke up. That's what happened. Well, hopefully for the Keishin, or excuse me, just, well, he's not advertised the Keishin, but hopefully for the Liger Suzuki match, if he busts out the Keishin, there's no red lights the whole match while they're <laughs> fighting each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. But yeah, pretty excited for that match, and we will, uh, we're going to preview King of Pro Wrestling. What were you thinking? My God. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm super, I got to tell you, I know we're going to do our preview, but like, this is my most anticipated match for for King of Pro Wrestling. Yeah, and I by think, far. I, I think it has a great potential for uh, winning October match of the month. Yeah, and the, bro. It's, if they only have one match, can this win? I keep saying it, but I feel like this is really like the top few to the year. I mean, they've right had multiple yeah tag matches though. Yeah, that's and true. And they've done several angles, so to me, this is definitely a few to the year candidate. It might be mine right now. Yeah, it might be. So moving on, we had Chaos taking bullet, taking on Bullet Club, representing Chaos. We had Hiroki Goto, Tomohiro Ishii, and Sho and Yo. And from Bullet Club, we had Yujiro, Takahashi, Taiji Ishimori, Jado, and Gato. Um, you know, this match was fine. I mean, you can't expect much with uh, Jado, Gato, and Yujiro on one side. So... I mean, so, there's only so much heavy lifting Taiji Ishimori can do. <laughs> exactly. And then there's only so much that Ishii can do um, going against those guys. And then it was your, you know, final I, little actually, match. Actually, if you think about it, that Chaos team is pretty freaking awesome. Yeah, that Chaos team is like Goto, stacked. Ishii, and Rapongi 3K. That's yeah. a freaking awesome team. Yeah, you know, you had your normal kind of Bullet Club shenanigans. Um, they got heat on Ishii at one point. They got heat on Goto for another point, And then kind of broke down towards the end. Coming down to um, Gato and Goto, and Goto hits the Ushigoroshi and the GTR to get the win for the Chaos team. Yeah, good and little, then, good little match. I mean, it was fine. It, I would, I would go a little lower than three stars, but it's fine for what it was. Yeah, and uh, post match, Goto grabbed the mic, and I don't have a translation for it, but I heard Jay White. So clearly, they are continuing to build up um, Goto and Jay White. We know Goto challenged Jay White for the IC strap, so. And where, where do you think we're seeing that? Because it's not on King Pro Wrestling, so I'm guessing. Um, I think we'll probably see it at Power Struggle. Power Struggle, yeah. Yeah. So I was trying to remember what the next tour was. Man, Power Struggle, bro. We're we're right on the edge of award season. Yeah, man. Oh my god. We have to start working on that. Oh my god. <sighs> yeah, it's right around the corner, man. Every time I think about Power Struggle, I'm like, oh, oh <laughs> crap, awards. <laughs> yeah. So, well, we're gonna get that get that out soon. So next up, we had uh, Tetsuya Naito and Bushi taking on Taichi and Doki. And again, another fine match here uh, with 
the LIJ boys against uh, some more Suzuki Goon guys here. And I don't know, it feels like kind of like Naito is kind of just in kind of a standstill right now since losing to Jay White. Uh, Naito and Bushi did pick up the win here. Bushi hit the MX on Doki to get the win for his team. And then Naito and Taichi were kind of staring off post match. So I got to tell you, I'm not excited to see another Taichi Naito feud program or match right now. Not, and, you know, their matches aren't bad, although. The, the the ones they had this year, even though there's a couple of them I liked, the overall opinion was most people weren't really a fan of them. Yeah, and there was they were full of shenanigans, and um, I don't know, man. I'm I'm not. Is that what we do? You know, we 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 take Naito down and then we we feed him Tai Chi, so that that's his uh, you know, rebuilding period. I think we could do a little better than that, Gato. Yeah, I just. I mean, yeah, we're really going to get Naito and Taichi at power struggle. I mean, we don't know for sure, but it seemed implied, and I, will, I wouldn't be surprised if they do that right. again. I mean, what what else does Naito do until to kind of build up to the Dome and get him back into the double title mix? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't so, have a good answer for you. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was that. So the next up, um, so... Last week, when we previewed this show, this match was not a title match. It was announced the title match uh, yesterday, so this became a never open weight six man tag team championship match as the champions Togi Makabe, Risuke Gucci, and Toriano defend against Hanma, Yoshihashi, and Tanahashi. This was part of Hana, uh, Tanahashi's 20th anniversary series that's been going on on this uh, New Japan Road Tour. We should have we should have guessed that this was going to be a six man tag that that it makes more sense, right? I mean, I wasn't even I, I you know what it was I forgot who the champions were yeah. so I didn't think about it. Well, I'm like this is Tanahashi's anniversary. They're probably going to want him to get a win, so they, they don't want him with a six man title. So they're probably not going to do that. But yeah, that was not what they have planned here. The titles were on the line, and Tanahashi's team lost. <laughs> yeah, um, but I mean, this was a fun little match. I mean, obviously you got. You know, six beloved, you know, baby face stars here kind of going back and forth. I mean, once again, nothing too outrageous, just kind of a, a nice, lighthearted, uh, fun match here. The crowd was into it. And Yano cradles Hanma for the win, and they retain the six man tag titles. Speaking of uh, Yano, I don't know if it's in the news. Did you see the comments that John Moxley made about him? I did. I didn't put it in the news, but yeah, I did say he said he doesn't want to like, wrestle. Um, Never wants to wrestle Yano again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too much for him, man. Too much. <laughs> he cannot handle handle the, the master thief. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, and then we have the main event of this. Wait, so that's what you got spoiled on? Yes. How did you get spoiled on that? Because um, well, what did Muzzle change his name to? He changed his name to like Yoshihashi will never win a title. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, and that is true. It's not really I'm, a spoiler if you think about it. I mean, that's just a fact. <laughs> right, but you know, maybe the greatness of Tanahashi could have lifted him up, and they they could have won these six man titles. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, agree with Murray here. I don't think that was necessarily a spoiler. I mean, there was no way you could have known that. The, oh, did you know this got changed to being a tag? Or a title match? Yeah, it did, yeah. Never mind, Muzza. You can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That line will never get old. I know. It's great. <laughs> and now we got Tony Schiavone back on TV, so maybe we'll get some uh, some more classic lines. I hope so. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, we had this uh, main event here with um, Kota Ibushi and Kazuchika Okada taking on Evil and Sonata, the rematch from... Fighting Spirit Unleashed in New York City. And uh, once again, this was another uh, really good main event between these two teams. There's a lot of great action. Um, the Sonata Okada spots looked really good. The um, the Evil and Ibushi spots looked uh, really good. I know you were, you were kind of down on both of these matches going into King of Pro Wrestling and not really excited it's basically because we kind of know what the deal is. Um, yeah, I don't want to be. I don't want to come off sounding that way. Like I am excited for the matches, but I'm not like to that fever pitch level. You know what I mean? Right. Because because we know what the deal is. Right. 
But I don't know. I, th- I thought that was pretty good action here, and I think they're going to have some great matches next week. And I think they've built it up as best as they possibly could. And that's not. I'm not saying that in a negative or detrimental way. Like, oh, well, they've done the best they could. No, they've done a really fantastic job building up both of these matches. Um, and if you're you're a fan of this product and you you know you um you're engaged in what's going on, you're probably invested in this. Um, you know, but my only real drawback is that it's happening at Camp Pro Wrestling, which is a right. big show, but we know. We right, know. Both, the, both of these matches would be more compelling if it was happening before Dome season. Probably, probably, like, yeah, absolutely it would right. be. But both both of these, all four of these guys have really good chemistry. Um, they've, you know, shown us throughout the year, especially during the G1 and, you know, the earlier feud throughout the year with Sonata and uh, uh, Okada, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just, just how excellent the matches between these four could be. And, you know, they, they've got a task in front of them. This is probably, I'm going to say, the biggest show um, that, yes, this is definitely the biggest show Okada and Sonata have ever faced off at, and similar um, with Ibushi and um, Evil. So yeah, they got a lot to live up to, and they've done a fantastic job. You know, both of the, both the tag matches they had, uh, the one last week in America and then this one here, they were both really good. Yeah, I mean, you know, four talented, talented dudes, obviously Okada, and Ibushi are just on a, a you know whole other level, but you know Sonata is great, and you know I think Evil is pretty good. Um, so yeah, both of these guys or all four of these guys kind of killed it here, and I'm yeah I'm really looking forward to the matches, even though it's kind of obvious who's going to win each one. I still think these guys are going to put on um, two you know four star plus matches here um, at Rio Goku for King of Pro Wrestling. And uh, before we move on to our King of Pro Wrestling review, we'll actually let me talk about the results of this match. Once again, we had Evil and Sonata winning. Uh, Evil hitting that everything is evil STO on Kota Ibushi to get the win for the team. So obviously they're kind of trying to you know plant the seed of doubt in our minds that um, that Ibushi is not going to be able to beat Evil after taking you know two losses to Evil back to back. Um, so kind of making it trying to trying to make you think that evil has a chance of winning next Monday. And of course, we've got the everything is evil uh, post match promo. How about Ibushi with the new briefcase? Yeah, the new fit. Yeah, you know, he's he had to make sure he didn't lose that contract. <laughs> uh, so before we move on, there, there was a question I missed from a Twitter follower at Twitter ain't shit. Um, revolving around Yoshihashi, he said, should they turn Yoshihashi heel or should they make him the next Captain New Japan? Um, <laughs> uh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's fine in the role he's at. Yoshihashi is fine. <laughs> uh, you know what, though? Turning him heel actually would probably, that could help him. I think... Yeah, I mean he's he sucks as a babyface. He's languishing. He's got very little real support. Why? You know why what? not? Why not do it? He he might they might have a good point there, and that might be like the most compelling thing that they could possibly do with him. Um, I'm not a big fan of the constant you know turns. We don't see a lot of that in Japan, and usually when it does happen, it's uh, pretty meaningful. So maybe that's like you know we we hear a lot of people say like a new coat of paint. You know, all the time. Right. I, I did think there was potential for him, you know, being the, the mole, mole. And, the mole in <laughs> chaos and uh, joining Bullet Club um, during that whole Jay White storyline because Jay was kind of was teaming with him without like the undercards of G1. I heard that um, they gave his uh, after he got injured, they gave his booking away to um, Kenta. Mm. No, nah, I'm just playing. <laughs> but to say that that's a for interesting one, one right there. <laughs> what if I just start making up like rumors on the on the air and I was like a good source told me. Well, then you would have people bashing us on on online like all the other, you know, top reporters. Well, I'm not on Twitter, so I wouldn't know about it, so I'd be fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, but yeah, we're trying to stay a credible show here. We're we're credible. Yeah, we're credible. That's want to keep that with keep it that way. All right, so that wraps up uh, New Japan Road. So next Monday from Rio Goku, we have King of Pro Wrestling. I'm excited. Yeah, I am excited too. On a Monday night, pretty big card. And what are we uh, gonna do? We're gonna um, do the show after after. The, you know, are we gonna record Tuesday? What are you thinking? 
I don't know because it's probably going to be a longer card. So I'm not. I'm not sure. I guess we'll have to. I think it's going to be a long show. Yeah, we might have to play it by ear. Um, yeah, we might end up recording Tuesday night instead of Monday night, or you know, if we start watching it early enough and it ends, maybe if we end like around eight or nine, maybe we can still record Monday night. So yeah, we'll play it by ear. Make sure you subscribe, stay tuned in the feed, and uh, you guys know when that episode will drop next week. But here we go, ladies and gentlemen. The only King of Pro Wrestling preview that you need in your life. <laughs> there is none that will be better. So let's start it off. So the first match of the night, we're going to have Risuke Taguchi and Rapungi 3K of Show and Yo taking on the Suzuki Goon team of the returning El Desperado, Yoshinobu Kanamaru, and Doki. Scale 1 to 10, how excited are you for El Desperado's return? Uh, like 9. I'm like a, I'm like an 8 and 3 quarters. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited that uh, El Desperado is coming back. You know, I felt like he was in line for a big push during the Best of the Super Junior run, and then he got that broken jaw during that um, that death match with Junior Kasai. Um, but, you know, now he's 100% back in action. It's going to be interesting to see kind of where he's set. I'm, I'm guessing with, you know, being in here for Pungi 3K, we got the Super Junior Tag League that will be starting in two weeks, I believe. So I'm, I'm guessing that it's going to be Desperado and Kanamaru. And so maybe they're trying to rekindle that rivalry with for, for Pungi 3K right oh God. here. Oh, God. <laughs> and, um, and we've seen enough of this. <laughs> we have, but, you know, there's not many other junior teams, so... Yeah, so I'm figuring, you know, both obviously Rapungi 3K, I'm sure they'll be in it. And I'm guessing it'll be Desperado and Kanamaru and Doki will be the odd man out. I think it's going to be Yo and Taguchi in the tournament <laughs> taking on Doki and Kanamaru. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do think Taguchi will be in the tournament, but um, teaming up with Rocky Romero. That's the rumors. Yeah, the, the coach and coach connection. Um, there was a post match. I forgot which show it was, but Rocky was like, you know, I think there is something behind this coach and coach connection, and we need to get, you know, let's do this. So I saw something on his uh, Instagram. Someone asked him about it, and he was like, he's like, we're still we're still negotiating. <laughs> so yeah. So uh, who you got here? Um, in this one, I'm gonna take Suzuki Goon. I think uh, the returning El Desperado is gonna give them enough of an edge. Plus, they've got the secret weapon in Doki. <laughs> So yeah, I see. Uh, I see Suzuki Goon taking this one. Yeah, I agree with you. I think um, El Desperado will probably get the pin, maybe over Sho and Yo, to kind of once again plant plant doubt that Rapungi 3K um, is not where they need to be for going into this tag team tournament and kind of building up some momentum from Desperado and Kanamaru. I will say this: I wouldn't sleep on this match. I think this will be a good little opener, um, and maybe just a. A, a smidge above what you're used to from a from an opener. I think um, you've got a lot of. There's probably going to be some comedy right. here, but I think that this is a really good lineup. I think this is going to be a good match. Yeah, I mean, no New Japan dads here. Mm-hmm. No, no young lions. You got, you know, some main quote unquote main roster guys here. So in the return, Desperado. I'm sure he's going to be fired up. So yep, keep your eyes planted on this one. The next up, we have Hiroshi Tanahashi and Tomioka Hanma taking on the most violent players, Togi Makabe and Toriano. Yeah, that's that's gonna be fun, man. Um, we don't get a lot of uh, teaming up between Makabe and uh, Yano. I know they had a brief reunion earlier in the year. Was that this year? When was the, was that this year? It was, was it was it last year? It wasn't last. Man, this year is like so much stuff has happened. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, I think that their uh, reunion was. Uh, there's probably someone listening right now like, it was last year, you idiots. Well, well actually, guys, <laughs> uh, the reunion happened. <laughs> I, I kinda, I'm kind of, i kind of blanking on that a bit, but since they did have that brief reunion, we haven't seen a lot of them uh, since that time. So this is kind of nice. And then, um, you know, Tanahashi and Hama going against them. Is this also considered part of Tanahashi's, like, reunion or... His anniversary. anniversary? Yeah. So... Um, I don't know. I don't have a lot of expectations here. I think it's kind of a nice way to put Tanahashi on the back burner and give him a match that's not like super strenuous or super demanding, but still has quote unquote meaning to it. He is second on the card, which is very surprising for a king of pro wrestling, even in 2019, given his um, you know status in the company. But um, do you have the feeling that something's happening here? 
Uh, I have the feeling something's happening here. Uh, somebody's going to attack Tanahashi. Yeah, and I don't have a particular person in general. I know that like we're there's speculations about the Jericho thing. That's a possibility, or pretty much anybody that maybe he's feuding with next. Like, cause the, to set up a power struggle. That's what it seems like to me. I don't know. That's just my gut instinct. It's like Tanahashi second on the card. That seems suspect to me. Well, I mean, he did have a big match during the Destruction Tour, so I don't know. It's just with with Zach. Yeah. So I don't know if just like you know. Have there been teases of him um, being involved in this mini tournament in any tangible way or not really? I think he's made a comment about being double champion. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure he has. Okay. At least, at least said something about wanting to be at the Dome. So, and, what, and what's the alternative? You think that, I mean, here's the thing. I think Tanahashi is doing something at the Dome. This is the last really big show before Tokyo Dome. He's second on the card. He's one of the most important figures in the company. If if I was a bet man, I'd bet that this just seems suspect. I think something's happening here. I mean, yeah, could could be angle alert. Uh, I, I, I I'm gonna say angle alert. There's <laughs> an ang- keep keep your spidey senses going because there's an I've got an angle alert waiting here. They might just have a nice little match. Him and Tanahashi. Him and Hama might win. And then maybe the screen goes up. Maybe we get a little projector action, or maybe yeah. maybe there's an attack. I don't know, but I feel like Tanahashi, Tanahashi being second on the card, just beating the most violent players. That doesn't do a lot for me. Yeah, at, at least not at King of Pro Wrestling. But then you, you give us a little angle, throw a little bit of old spi- old some old bay on there, give it a little spice, <laughs> give us um, a little taste, throw some goya on there. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Give us a little taste. I, yeah. think, I think that this is going to set something up for probably down the line the rest of the year, I bet. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll go with the uh, Tanahashi and Hanma team winning as well. I agree. So Although, the, what if what if someone upsets him? Like, what, what if he gets attacked and they lose or something like that? That's also a possibility. True, yeah. He gets attacked and then Hanma gets pinned once again by Yano. Mm, mm. So, moving on, we got a multi-man match here with Los Ingrobanables de Japón. The team of Tetsuya Naito, Shingo Takagi, and Bushi taking on the Suzuki Goon team of Zack Sabre Jr., Lance Archer, and Tai Chi. Oh man, um, to steal a <laughs> to steal a phrase from our good friends over at Super J Cast, pants down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is going to be a really good multi man match. I mean, all LIJ matches are great. We've said it time and time again on this show um, just how well that unit works together. Even with the recent addition of Shingo, he fits right in with those guys, and they always have great multi-man matches. And to me, I feel like this match, there's going to be some setup for maybe power struggle with a double title match. I think maybe you have Naito beat Pin Saber here. And uh, Naito can get a Rev Pro title match at Power Struggle. Here's the only thing: they've been teasing Zack Saber potentially being involved in the um, in in the mini tournament. Right now, one thing we I, I want to say this because we take a lot of like victory laps and it's something that I think maybe we missed the boat on. But I heard a lot of other people, including like Dave Meltzer and other like podcast speculating. They were talking about, remember how I've been saying that maybe it'd be eight people? Right. Well, it seems like what a lot of people are speculating is that Zach will be the guy that Naito has to overcome between now and Dome season to get himself back in that contention. Right. And so, like, for instance, Okada has Sonata. Um, Sonata Ibushi has Evil. Um, Jay White has Goto. You feed Naito Zach Sabre. Right. You know, with their history, and I, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, did, is that what where you were thinking? Is that what you were, you know? Well, based off this match, I was, I was thinking maybe because you know you still got power struggle. I was thinking, yeah, you, you do a, a Rev Pro title match with Naito and Saber here. But if you do a Rev Pro title match and Naito wins that belt, then he goes into the mini tournament with with the Rev Pro title. Plus, Zach just won it back. I don't know if you should do a title match unless Naito loses again. And then and what? And then he's just not in the mini tournament at all. No, then he has. To, I don't know. He, he has. There's not a lot of time. All right. I don't know. I think. I think that you have to feed him Zach to get because Zach's the one other guy who's been 
you know, talking all the, all the junk, saying he's going to be a triple champion and all that. Right, so you just do a non-title match? Yeah. I think that that's probably the way you go. But um, one thing I want to I take note of, um, this match looks awesome. Naito, Shingo, uh, Bushi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but taking on a team of Zack, Lance, and Taichi, I mean... I really like that's a really tight uh, Suzuki Gun unit right that's there. That's an awesome Suzuki Gun unit, and um, you know your average your average New Japan f- viewer might look at this card and be like, "Oh, we got a bunch of multi man matches and then five singles matches." Uh 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 uh. These are not your standard everyday multi man road to show matches. These all have a lot of purpose and a lot of reason. Just like you mentioned, the first match it has implications for the uh, Junior Tag League. The second one is this Tanahashi thing, which I think that there's an angle coming. Yeah. And then you've got this one here, and I think that there's implications between Naito and, and Zack Sabre. Plus, this matchup, these six guys, we never see that this per, these particular units. This is not your average six mans from both of these units just going at it. Right. Um, yeah. And as we know, LIJ always has such cohesive matches, plus all the talent on the other side. I think this is a little sleeper tag right here. Yeah, and then obviously Tai Chi's in this match, so they could go the Naito Tai Chi route based off what we saw in New Japan Road. Also, oh god, I I, I was totally avoiding. That. <laughs> <laughs> um, and maybe we it would be pretty cool if we got a a, a Shingo Zack Saber match at Power Struggle. That would be pretty cool. I would be I would be completely down for that. Um, I'm just trying to put my Booker hat on and figure out, you know. How are we getting Naito there? Maybe am I copping from too much? Is that what's happening here? Because it seems like that's still in my mind the most logical thing that they they do yeah. for the dome. How do we get there, dude? I, I don't know. It seems like this is the first step. I think it. I think it's pretty. I think oftentimes the simplest answer is usually the right answer. I think that this is going to establish a feud between him and Zach. Maybe the thing with him and Taichi is just a li- that we saw on road was just a little bit of a red herring, and we're actually going Zach and uh, Naito. And that's how Naito, because it's pretty easy. Zach's been, you know, talking junk about getting into that tournament. Naito obviously has been talking about it. Seems pretty logical to match them up, plus all the history they have with one another. Right, but do you think they would want to save that as a opening round in the tournament? No, because I don't think they're actually doing the eight God, you think person anymore. I think that each of these guys... The yep, I think each of these guys has has one individual they have to get through and we're seeing the establishment of that now with the Sonata and Okada match and evil and Ibushi as well as um, um, Jay White and Goto at power struggle. I think you round out that power struggle card by doing a Naito and Zack Saber match. And then eventually once, once power struggles over, they can announce the tournament with their four guys. Gotcha. Yeah. That I think sense. that's, I think that's what they're doing. Yeah. But I, I do think that the LIJ team is going to lose here. I, I would agree with that. That makes sense. Yeah, with uh, the one junior on their side facing a team of three heavyweights. Um, yeah, I think Bushi could potentially be the one to take the pinfall here. That makes sense. And I'm, I'm excited for this match. I'm, I think that there's a lot of uh, implications and possibilities. I mean, you know, one thing you didn't throw out there, what about Shingo and Taichi? That could be an interesting match. That's, that's Did interesting. they wrestle in the G1? Or were they in different blocks? They did. They did. Yeah. And it was good. Yeah. They had, yeah. They had a good match. Yeah. 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 Well, let's not sleep on our boy Archer. What's going on with Archer? Dude. Archer and Shingo? I am New Japan. I back up the Brinks truck, get this man a contract, and get him locked down. I don't know if they have Brinks in Japan, but whoever they got, whatever truck back, they got. Back up whatever truck you got. <laughs> back up the Yen truck. <laughs> yes. And give this man the money. Put this man, give this man a contract. Because I'm telling you, next year... Bro, if I was Tony Khan, I would do whatever it takes to get this guy. Yes, dude. If they don't lock Archer down, you best believe Tony Khan's going to send him a contract. Uh, Paul Levesque's going to send him a contract. Uh, Ring of Honor's going to try some uh, Impact. All these companies. Dax, Tampa Bay Pro. <laughs> all these companies. Hey, you know, Dax brought in Swerve. He, yeah, he might, he, he might try to bring in Archer. <laughs> Billy, uh, Billy Corgan might might have found his next NWA World's Heavyweight Champion. Dude, yeah, NWA Power, I think, starts this week on YouTube. Uh, but, yeah, there's going to be so many options for Archer, and he's just been killing it this year. So New Japan needs to lock him down. They need to do something with this guy. Um, you know, I would hate to see him thrown away in a multi-man. Listen, as much as we like to praise New Japan for being star makers, which they are, being incredible bookers, which they are, 
there have been many, many times in the past where there are just certain guys, for whatever reason, they see them in a certain role. They don't plan to do anything beyond what they – they have their stars that they've already picked out, their hand-selected right. guys, and they miss out on guys. And it's happened plenty of times over the years. I mean, we've seen a lot of guys come and go. And um, I I hope Archer's not one of them because, like, yeah. he had one of the best G1s that you could possibly have. And it's like, I don't want to see him go the way of, like, a Michael Elgin or something like that, you know? Right, yeah. I want, I want to see Archer here for the long run. Same here. And, you know, for the long a, haul. He's been doing a lot of indie bookings lately, especially uh, with Warrior Wrestling. He's been on their shows quite a bit and doing some other kind of indie shots. So... Yeah, man, New Japan, they, they need to lock him down, get him set for the future. Um, he's a guy I think would make a great title contender for B-Show, him versus Okada or Ibushi, whoever's going to be the champion next you know, year. I think, hmm. I think we could get Archer on this show. I think we can get Archer on. Let's get Archer on the show, see how he feels about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, for the uh, two-year anniversary, maybe we could get Archer on. Let's reach out to him. All right. Let's put some feelers out there. <laughs> we'll have we'll have our people talk to his people and uh, our people is Jeremy, <laughs> 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 and his people is him. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So uh, moving on, we have uh, chaos of Hiroki Goto, Tomohiro Ishii, and Yoshihashi taking on the Bullet Club team of Switchblade, Jay White, Kenta, and the Tokyo Pimp Yujiro Takahashi. Again. Um, you know, you've got your Yoshihashi and your, your Yujiro there, so you've got two guys that are both pin eaters, which actually causes, you know, creates a sense of doubt. You don't really know which team is going over, which I kind of like that aspect. Right. I feel this one can go either way. Definitely. But, you know, we've got the big um, feud between Jay White and Hiroki Goto leading into Power Struggle over the Intercontinental title. But one thing that's also intriguing here is Kenta and Ishii on opposite sides once again. Mm, so maybe we're getting another never title match at Power Struggle. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't. Um, or maybe even Road to Power Struggle, one of those Cork and Hall type shows. Yeah. That's a possibility. But, um, man, we always talk about we always want Goto and Ishii to tag. Um, Here we are. I mean, we got Yoshihashi in there, but <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I'll take it. Yeah. If we have to deal with Hashi to get Goto and Ishii together. Yeah. It's and fun. Uh, I think, you know, Jay White and Kenta are the top two guys in Bull Club. So this is, there's a lot of implications here. I mean, this again might look like a random tag, but you look at the level of talent, the stories behind it, everything on this card, you know, it, if, if, if you're a new listener or a new viewer of New Japan Pro Wrestling, I, some of you are probably rolling your eyes because you you know the deal, and you guys are you guys been here for the long haul. You get it. But for those of you who don't understand, you might be looking at this and you're like, it looks like a lot of tag matches. No, this is a really well booked King of Pro Wrestling card. I know it might not be as sexy as like say a Dominion or a Wrestle, uh, Kingdom. A Wrestle Kingdom, but for a secondary King of Pro Wrestling, and, and I know it's not as stacked as some of the King of Pro Wrestlings used to be years ago. It really isn't. They they've kind of gotten away from that, but. This is a lot better than them splitting the card over three nights. Right. This is a pretty well-booked card. The tag matches we're getting all have meaning. They're all building to something leading into Dome season. I'm excited. I actually think that these uh, these four tag matches are pretty intriguing. Yeah, and what I like about these um, New Japan kind of big shows, when it's, one, when it's a one-day big show, to me this card is kind of set up like a, like a UFC card. Like, you have your, your your kind of prelim undercard matches. You know, the, obviously they're not the draw for the show, but there's still implications. A guy wins, that's going to move him up in the rankings. They could have been an impressive fight, you know, a crazy knockout. There's something crazy that could always happen on the prelims that kind of builds to the future. And then when that main card starts, you get your, your big main fights that, peop, that people are paying to see and attracted to. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And you know what else to kind of add to that analogy? I didn't know you were going to say that, but that's a good analogy. Usually at the top of the prelims, they'll have one headline prelim you know, match to kind of draw people in. And if you're going to draw that analogy, Jay White and Goto being the preview for, for next month kind of fits that bill. It's the top of the tag matches right. leading into the singles matches. And, um, you know, we the, these top five matches look freaking awesome. And we're going to talk about them here in a second. But before we move on, what are your final thoughts on Chaos versus uh, Bullet Club, the six man tag? Where do you think what do you think this is about? What where are we going? I think we're gonna have Goto getting the win here, build up some momentum, going mm. into the title challenge. 
because uh, I think Jay White will beat him in Power Struggle. Um, yeah, I think that that's probably a good call. I wouldn't be surprised to see Ishii hit Ujiro with a uh, hit him with a um, brainbuster brain and yeah. get the one two three. Although when you got Kenta and Jay White on the same side, it's pretty that's a pretty mm, stacked yeah. team. I wouldn't be surprised with some uh, Bullet Club shenanigans. Master Heaters out there, Jado, God, or Gato, Jado, whoever. Uh, and, yeah, you know, with Kenta follows God. That's true too. This actually, this match, as stacked as the talent is, has the potential to be like the most bullshit <laughs> actually of the night. Oh man! So someone's gonna be like, I was listening to Keeping a Strong Style. This they said this match was gonna be good. <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> they thought this was gonna be your your prelim main event. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So, yeah, so that wraps up the undercard matches. Now we're going to move into our big five singles matches here. So first we have Jushin Thunder Liger taking on the king, Minoru Suzuki. And before we get into this match, um, I think it's a great place to talk about it here instead of the news. There's been news about Minoru Suzuki Joe Lanza over at the voices of wrestling.com on this past week's flagship. He talked about um, the future of Minoru Suzuki that he had a source that said that um, Minoru Suzuki is planning on leaving new Japan, that he's unhappy with his spot. That if, it, if it wasn't for the Liger angle, that he would already be gone and that uh, pro wrestling Noah is a potential landing spot for him. So we're about to see, uh, Minoru Suzuki and some Kido Kiyomiya action. Yeah, kind of uh, recalling that story. That was a young boy he was kind of beating up before he left, right? You know, I didn't watch a lot of the Suzuki Goon stuff when they were over Noah. I followed it like from afar. I saw a lot of the major main events, but the the night in night out stuff. You know, I don't know. I don't know if Kiyomiya was a young lion back then or whatever, or young boy, whatever they call yeah, it. I, heard, I think, yeah, Lanza and them were talking about it. I think that's kind of the... That's the, more his wheelhouse. He yeah, loves he, Noah. Yeah. I mean, there's some matches from there. I mean, there's some really, really great main events um, from that time period. But, you know, I wasn't watching the rest of Suzuki Goon stuff, and I've never been a huge Noah fan. Not that I don't like Noah. You know, I love... I mean, like, yeah, I love Noah from, like, the early days, like, when... It first started and all the big, you know, all the big uh, four pillar matches and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've never been like as into it as New Japan only because it wasn't as accessible to me when I was younger. And it was, you know, harder to actually get my hands on some of that stuff. I wasn't really a tape trader. So, but um, yeah, I never really got into the Noah. I, I know it's a fantastic promotion and I don't know about the history with that stuff there, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, I mean, technically, Suzuki is a freelancer. Right, yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up, like, everywhere. He could literally, like, if he leaves, I wouldn't be surprised to see him show up in All Japan, Big Japan, DDT, Noah, you know, Tampa yeah. Bay Pro, all of them. <laughs> yeah, Dax, bring up, bring Suzuki in. Oh, my God. A Suzuki versus Aaron Nova. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> But we do have a lot of questions here kind of surrounding Suzuki and his future. Let me ask you something before we mm -hmm. move on. Now, we both, we know Joe. Good friend of the show. Someone we respect. Someone who is very reputable. But how does he know this? That's my question. Joe's got sources. Right. And I know he talks to people in the company, but where's, that's like, okay, here's the most bizarre thing about it. No one else has reported this. I've seen it all over the internet on major news sites, and every single major news site is like, Joe Lanza, Voices of Wrestling, has said. I'm like, what? It's just Joe. Like, that's the only right. person and, who said know, it. And Joe said, he was like, hey, you know, don't go out and throw us on Reddit. This is what my sources heard. Here are from two different sources. He well, was, it's like, this is like the biggest story that I think he might have ever broke. Um, not that I follow them to the point where I know every story they've ever broke. I couldn't give you, like, a list, but I've never been on, like, Cage side seats or any, I, and I don't know if that's the website I was on, but I was on a bunch of websites and they all have Joe Lanza of Voices of Wrestling has said, and I'm like, did you like everybody literally rec like reported it like directly from him? So right. it's like if it's not true, like they all basically like they've named him. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I am just like I'm curious. I'm not I'm not questioning his validity. 
I'm not. I'm just more curious, like, where did he hear it from? Right. And how come no one else is saying it? Everyone else who's reporting it is literally reporting it as him as the source. There's no one else who's like, yeah, I've heard this. I mean, what do you think? Do you think it, I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire. I don't think, I don't think he would have reported it if he didn't actually hear that. Right. Because uh, Joe is very good at keeping things close to the vest if he doesn't have enough sources or enough information to report it. Mm-hmm. And so just, you know, listening to him on his daily updates and the flagship, I don't think he would have released this information without being somewhat sure that there's definitely smoke to this fire. And plus, if you look at the booking of Suzuki this year, I mean, no big Wrestle Kingdom match, uh, not in the G1. Um, you know, he's kind of just kind of been in the background this year. Yeah, he got the, the big title shot at Royal Quest, but compared to previous years, Suzuki has definitely been de-emphasized, and I could see him being unhappy in the role he's at, you know, yes, he is what 50, 51, but he can still go and he probably still wants to go. And I, he, I just think what's unique about this is there have been other times they've reported things and sometimes they break the story first and then a lot of other people will validate what they have said and mm-hmm. then you hear it from multiple sources. In this case, and maybe I'm wrong here, like you, you, you're more on the internet than I am, but from what I've seen, I haven't seen anyone else be like, oh yeah, I can corroborate this. He's the only person that has said it. So it's kind of like he's he's a man out there on an island unto himself with what he said. Um, but again, like you just said, I don't think he would have said it unless he had like a legit source behind it. Because right. that's not really been their MO over there at Voice Wrestling. Right. And I can't remember, because I've listened to so much Observer Radio the last couple of days, I can't remember if Dave has talked about it or mentioned it. Um, I've been listening to um, Observer and I haven't heard anything. Gotcha. So yeah, so be interesting to see if this story kind of picks up if other people like Dave or Sean Ross Sapp or you know any of the other guys kind of pick some information up. Emily Pratt, who kind of broke that story about um, Gato. Yeah, and it's not to say that you have to have other people corroborating it. It's just unique in that that's usually what does happen, and then the fact that it hasn't happened here does make me curious. That's all. Like I'm very curious about it more so than anything else. Yeah. So lots of questions about Minoru Suzuki. I don't want him to leave. Yeah. I don't want him to leave, I'll tell you that much. I mean, like, I I can't see myself going out of my way to catch him in Champions Carnival or anything like that. Right. Personally, like, I want to see the King of Pro- I want to see Suzuki in New, New Japan. Japan Pro Wrestling. Yeah. So uh, first question from Why Did You Do That Bro, our boy Samson. He says, is Saber Gun becoming a likely reality with the recent rumors about Suzuki, or was it disband? Well, why did you do that, bro? You've forgotten a third possibility. They could all go with him. They did before. Right. But I feel like a guy like Tai Chi, the way they've been pushing him, I could see him staying. Oh, I'm not saying it's a likely outcome. Right. I'm just saying, like, if... Majority, like if the group's like we're we're like Suzuki's like let's go. I could see Tai Chi being the one guy being like mm, nah, I'm I'm good. It's true, but keep in mind, Tai Chi's an outsider, Archer's an outsider, Kanemaru's an outsider, Taka's an outsider. None of those guys are New Japan guys, right? So now my one big thing is like what you mentioned that they've all a lot of um like Desperado in particular, Tai Chi in particular, Archer in particular, those three guys specifically come to mind as being people that New Japan has really gone out of their way to protect and elevate and invest in. And they do have pretty bright... And and obviously Zack Sabre Jr. So there's four right there. Those are four guys who have huge futures and investment within New Japan Pro Wrestling. And I don't know if it would be if this is the right time for them to part ways and go, you know, go out into the rest of the pro landscape or even abroad. Um, You know, I don't know if they can go somewhere else and make more money. You know, New Japan is in the middle of like one of their most lucrative time periods ever. I don't know what their deals are, how much money they're making, but it seems like it wouldn't make a lot of sense to leave. Right. That being said, with all the investment that New Japan's put into them. If they did leave with Minoru Suzuki, 
they would probably be like kings no matter where they went. Right, especially if they're going to a you know another Japanese promotion. Oh yeah, Noah's been on the rebrand and trying to pick business up, and you know those shows that they're doing, uh, Wrestle Kingdom weekend to have some Suzuki Gun guys on there, that would be big. So it'd be yeah. interesting. I mean, we saw what happened over the past few years with um over the last year with all those guys, all those um, strong hearts. Yeah, the uh, OWE guys. All the OWE guys, they left, you know, Dragon Gate and then kind of infiltrated all these other smaller companies like Wrestle One and all that sort of stuff. And I mean, they popped business everywhere that they went. There is a market out there for if a if a team from New Japan likes Suzuki Goon, and we've already seen it. History is repeating itself. Like, yeah, the stuff with Noah didn't end up working out ultimately, but initially, the first six months of it. Dude, did they ever do huge business? They did huge business. And that's kind of what the invasion angles were when, you know, um, what am I? I forget names. What's wrong with me? Um, Who's the dude from Strong Hearts? Oh, uh, Shima. Yeah, I was going to say Shingo. (laughs) Yeah, when Shima and all all those guys, like, took off and and went into all these other companies, and um, they did really well. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's maybe something that's on their radar, something they're thinking about. Um, but also, I, don't, I did hear, too, that I think the, the booker of Noah or somebody in the Noah office is really good friends with Suzuki also. That would make sense. And then, you know, there's the other possibility, the possibility that Suzuki leaves. He doesn't need Suzuki Goon at this point. If he left, Saber Goon really could be a possibility, or they could even disband in something else maybe a little bit, I know people love that idea and they're married to it, and I think it would be really cool too, so I'm not against it, but think of all the cool um, faction like setups you could have by splitting those guys and doing different things. Right. It, it creates a whole new dynamic in New Japan Pro Wrestling, and I would be, I'd be here for that. Um, I'm kind of ready for them to kind of shake things up uh, across the board. Yeah, I feel like the factions have been kind of stale. Five, six years, seven years, yeah, man. Yeah, kind of the same. It's kind been of, a lot of the yeah. same. So, um. I think that's exciting stuff. Um, I'm just, you know, at the same time, like, I love Minoru Suzuki. He's one of my favorite guys. I don't want to see him leave. Yeah. Uh, Next question from Dan Coffin. He says, if Suzuki actually leaves New Japan, where would you like to see him go? Noah, AEW, somewhere else? What becomes of Suzuki Goon? So I think we've kind of dealt with the Suzuki Goon question. We don't really have a definitive answer. I think, I mean, do you see any other scenarios playing out other than what I've just described? Well, I mean, with the the wrestling landscape the way it is, I mean, there I think there is a U.S. play to bring Suzuki in. Well, um, no, I mean before that, uh, like with Suzuki Goon. Uh, like. um, yeah, um, I don't think, it, uh, yeah, I think it can go either way. Like, like you said, I feel like Suzuki is a big enough star where he can kind of go on his own, and then you could have Sabre take over. I mean, even Taichi take over. That's a possibility. That's something I thought about, too. That is a possibility. Yeah, like, I think, you know, being the Japanese guy, the star they've been kind of pushing, I feel like he, it could be Taichi Goon and not Saber Goon. Um, or they could be, like, co, co-leaders, co Dangerous Techers. <laughs> yeah, Dangerous Ticker Goon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, also, or, like, like you said, they could all go. Um, so, yeah, I think it can go either way. And you were saying that there's a U.S. play? Yeah, I think there's a U.S. play for Suzuki. I don't think he will sign a full-time contract, but I definitely think a company like AEW, like Impact, who's bringing in Marifuji for Bound for Glory, uh, there there are companies that would use Suzuki to set up maybe a one-off pay-per-view feud or try to bring him in for multiple TV dates. Uh I mean, he's already he's doing some indie bookings. I think he's doing. I think it's Warrior Wrestling. He's he's going to be wrestling at. Uh, I think that's. I can't remember, but yeah, he's I gonna, think that's just a signing. I think I think he's wrestling. Oh, is he wrestling? Like, I think Kurt Angle's just signing, but I think Suzuki's actually wrestling on that. Show. When I saw that that they were both like listed, I was like, oh my god, Kurt Angle's wrestling Minoru Suzuki, <laughs> and like for a half second, I like really excited for that, but um. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know what he could do in the U.S. Obviously, there's like you mentioned. I mean, he has a following here too, but to the larger, more mainstream like U.S. fan, I don't know if they know about Suzuki. Right. I don't know how marketable he really is, given the language barrier. Um, I mean, I don't know what they would do with him in say like an AEW 
or even like an impact. I think impact is almost like a little bit more indie based at this point than some of these other companies. And, you know, they can go into like a diehard little, cause they, they're they filling up little, little tiny arenas anyways. And I mean, you can kind of appeal to a hardcore fan base there. Um, Ring of honor. I don't know. I guess they could <laughs> actually, you know what, if you want my opinion, Ring of Honor might be like the best fit for him in the U.S. He's got a history there. He has opponents that he's familiar with. Uh, the partnership with New Japan. He's wrestled there quite a bit. Um, that might actually be a place. I'm not saying he would land there, but I I feel I would feel more confident in seeing him wrestle there as opposed to other, one some of the other major companies like uh, AEW or obviously I would I couldn't see him in WWE or anything like oh, that. Oh no, I, yeah. Well, I, I mean, could, I could see MLW bringing him in. Yes, MLW could definitely bring him in. Um, I I could also see like some of the larger indies. Like, I could definitely see him do a PWG. I could oh, definitely yeah. see him doing but, a GCW. You know, they they brought Liger in for NXT. They could they could do a takeover with Suzuki. He's versus. not Liger. I mean, in Japan, yeah, he is. But in America, he's not Liger. Like, I don't think NXT would use him like that. Now, they if they really really wanted to invest in a guy like him, they could put that money machine behind him and familiarize people with him. But uh, you think Vince can put money behind a 50-year-old dude like that? Well, I think maybe Triple H would. I don't think he would. Just for if it's going to be just one match, like bringing Suzuki, like they did for Liger, it was one. Strang- stranger things have happened, but right. I, would not, I wouldn't count on it. Yeah, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to kind of see what, what eventually does happen. If he does end up going... And where he's going to go. If there's anywhere, I'd like to see him go. I know Noah's like the big play, but personally, personally, if I wanted him to go anywhere other than New Japan, it would have to be All Japan. There's a lot of guys in All Japan that I would love to see him wrestle. Um, and, and at the same time, I think if he leaves, he should just be a freelancer, and I could see him work all these companies. That's what he did for years and years. Even when he was working in New Japan, he was working all these other companies. It's only been relatively recently that... He's been so exclusive with New Japan. Right. I mean, um, you know, going into WrestleMania weekend next year, you know, people are asking who are the top indie guys who are going to be on all these shows. Like, I would love to see Suzuki, you know, WrestleCon Super Show, another blood sport. Heck, get him on spring break versus Joey Janela in a crazy match. Like, let's get Suzuki here. I got to tell you, I'm not really interested in him and Joey Janela. <laughs> 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 but uh, I would love to see him at spring break. Absolutely. So. Uh, next question from NJPW Extension Danny. Um, kind of kind of covered this. He said with the news that Suzuki's probably out of his way. Well, we see ZSJ turn on him to become the leader of Saber Goon. Uh, so we kind of talked about that um, with the potential of Saber taking over. Um, again, I feel like it might be more likely of Taichi taking over. Um, then he has an off topic question. He says, if there's time, uh, what can Josh tell us about WrestleLand? No? No, no, no. I'm just shaking my head because I'm like, Damn it. <laughs> uh, so what can you tell us about Rustland? Did it produce any memorable shows or angles? Okay, perfect. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's a good question. Um, I think I think that a lot of people want to see the Saber Goon thing happen. I think that there's a lot of reasons that that makes sense for them to do that, especially with how hard they've pushed uh, Zack Saber. And so, yeah, I mean, I could totally see Zack, like, kicking him out and them establishing Saber Goon. Yeah. And you know what? I know the Saber Goon kind of has like a cool, like, you know, ring to it. And this would kind of be like take the, the same way that like Suzuki Goon took over Kojima Goon. Mm-hmm. They're going to do like Saber Goon. But I wouldn't be surprised if like Zach was like just renamed it something entirely like something like what a British, like some weird British unique, like something from some punk bands, like right. song that he heard that no one knows or <laughs> only like really cool people that, that are not us know about. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised about that. Um, you know what? I can't really talk a lot about the Russell land stuff. I, I wasn't watching a lot like during that time period. Like I know, I know about it. Um, but yeah, I'm not, you know what? Let's do this. Give me a week. I'll do some research. I'll answer your question next week. Boom. How about that? Boom. So we'll get back to wrestling next week. Yeah, wrestling. Th- I mean, what I do know, they're like, they were produce shows. They were like those, they, they did a lot of like very, in like the, um, I don't know the exact time period. I'm guessing like the early to mid 2000s. There was a lot of like, a lot of the companies were doing it. All Japan was having all these really weird produce shows and New Japan had a bunch of them. Like, 
DDT still does that. DDT has all these weird subsets with like produce shows. I mean, I guess in recent years we've seen a few few things like that, like um, you know, like the Lionsgate projects or mm. some of the other like um, produce shows that like maybe like Kenny did or like Tai Chi Tai Chi Mania stuff like that. That's kind of like what WrestleLand was. I'm, I don't remember who ran WrestleLand specifically. There were some angles that were built off of it, and some some guys that got brought into the company. But I, you know, th- those are the dark ages, man. I, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. All right. So now let's actually talk about this Liger and Suzuki match they've done. S- Sam had a question. Yeah, I think uh, it makes sense to ask talk about that after we oh, gotcha. talk okay, about cool. the match. Uh, so yeah, so Liger and Suzuki. They've done an excellent job of building this match up all year. All the teases with the multi-man matches and the brawling. And then finally, we got the Kishin Liger angle. Um, this angle at New Japan Road. The thing is at a boiling point. I think this is going to be... This could be a strong style fire of the year candidate. Possibly. Possibly. I don't know if it's going to be strong style or not, but it it has the potential to be that on that sort of level of violence. It seems like it has to be, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, you know what I think this is going to be like, if you want my opinion, I don't think this is going to be like a strong style fight. I think this is going to be very similar to what we see in Lucha Libre. What do you mean? Like like, a... Like a... Like, like a Lucha de Espuetas matches. Like, I'm not saying that this is a bet match or anything like that, but, you know, those style matches, like the ones that even just happened recently, who, who wrestled at the... Um, the big CMLL show, and they had it was um, Blue Demon Junior against. Uh, uh, was that that was Triple A? Yeah. Oh, that was Triple A. Yeah. Uh, Blue Demon against uh, man, I'm blanking right Freaking now. Freaking A. Well, those those matches with the old guys where they're just really, Doctor Wagner. It was Doctor Wagner. Yeah. 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 I think that this is gonna be closer to a Doctor Wagner Blue Demon Junior in style, and this is probably gonna be bloody. Yeah. If you want my opinion, I think this is gonna. There's, I'm not saying they're gonna blade. They might, but this this is gonna be a violent match, and I think it's gonna be closer to that southern style that that lucha walk and brawl. This is gonna be closer. That, uh, L.A. Park. It's closer to an L.A. Park and Roosh match. Given given these two competitors and given how good they are at working the crowd and everything like that, I don't see these guys coming in there clobbering each other. I see them doing a lot of. Smoke and mirrors, walk and brawl, like, bloody, like, you know. And th- they'll probably have some high spots. They'll probably have some submissions. But I think it's going to be closer to, like, a lucha, like, bet match. Those those very violent, very bloody bet matches. If you want, in my opinion, I think that's what this is going to be. Yeah, I think this is going to be, yeah, this, this has to be violent and, all, and a brawl just the way it's been built up and the heat and animosity between these two guys. There was a time where I would have told you I thought that this was – might have even been shooty to a degree mm. be- because of their background with one another and, you know, the, f- the match they had back in Pancrase and all that. But And even some of the angles that Liger was talking about, his training and stuff. But now, given the direction it's taken with the Keishan Liger stuff. Yeah, I think it's, it's elevated the, beyond that. Yeah, and you know what else leads me to think it's going to be walk and brawl like style is just how often that's, you know, the well work that uh, Suzuki goes to with the chairs and everything like that, and I think Liger's going to play that game with him. Yeah. And I think I think they're going to be all over freaking um, Ryogoku, and that's where they're going, right? Ryugoku. Yes, Ryogoku. Yep. I always have to check myself because <laughs> I, I, I feel like there's nothing more embarrassing than saying the wrong city, like or the wrong like stadium, but or arena. But um, yeah, I think they're going to be all over Ryogoku, and they're going to. I think it's going to be bloody, bro. Yeah, like, I, I do. The one thing um, I would say though is Suzuki, don't try to tear at this man's mask. <laughs> Leave that freaking mask on. <laughs> Trust me, you don't you don't know what's under there. Maybe hey, maybe Liger is gonna tear it off himself. That's possible. Yeah. So now the million dollar question: uh, Who is winning this match? Oh man, I don't know. Because <laughs> you know, initially when this feud started, I was like, "Oh, Suzuki is easily gonna beat this guy." I never thought that. Oh well. Well, in the very beginning when they started, I was like, "This is." Uh, I feel like Suzuki, like, they'll have a good match with Suzuki. He's clearly going to win. But as it's gone on, especially after the Keishin Liger angle and the news of Suzuki potentially leaving and this being the angle why he stayed, maybe uh, Liger gets a big win. And 
knock Suzuki out of New Japan. That's possible. Like that's so initially, I guess initially I kind of thought that Suzuki probably would beat Liger. I still kind of feel that way. Yeah, part of me feels that way, but another because, part because Liger puts people over and he's and he's on his way out, and I just feel like that's what he's going to do. Plus, like, I don't know. God, I this is this is one of the hardest matches pr- to predict all year. I I I haven't even thought about who's going to win this match until this moment. Mm. It hasn't been a question in my mind. I've just been wondering what's going to happen, not who's going to win. Mm-hmm. And now I'm like, oh. The way that Liger's talking makes me think Suzuki has to, like, win. Yeah. But given the recent developments, the rumors, and everything like that, whew. Um, you know what? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Liger. I'm going to go for Liger win here. I think I'm going with Liger. And that, that surprises. I Everything, all my gut instincts are telling me Suzuki. Same here. But I think I'm gonna say Liger, mm. but I'm not confident. This is like a fifty-fifty match if there ever was one. So here's here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. If we are right, we are geniuses. If we are wrong, it was for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought you were saying like, here's the deal, and you're gonna make a deal with the fans. And I was like, I'm not ready to wager anything. No. What kind of bet are you making just, on the air? Just want to drop sir? drop my EPO line. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so before we move on to the next match, question from Sir Sam. You know, actually, Sir Sam has been uh, talking a little bit of you know trash about you know, you know if you're if you're ready for your your quiz showdown on the, the Rookie and Clyde Wrestling Show. Let's just be clear. I've done no preparation for this because no preparation is needed. I can walk into that quiz and I will freaking smoke him <laughs> without any sort of preparation, and then I'll move on to the finals rants. Psh, that'll be easy work, <laughs> light work. <laughs> Oh man! They, they 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 basically gave me the the most daunting test in the first round, which was Jeremy Donovan walked through that man, and now yeah, <laughs> the, the, this 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 tournament wasn't seated correctly. It was not seated we, correctly. We should have been in the finals, <laughs> but you know they wanted had a, a hot opener. I, yeah. Hey, you know what? I've enjoyed the Ricky and uh, Ricky and Clive Quiz Time Invitational Tournament, but I will say like there have been some close matches, but. Even though we were part of it, listening back to it, our quiz was like the hardest s- one. Right? It was the hardest <laughs> one, and it was so heated. Oh man! Yeah. No, you know what? Like, I'm actually low key. I'm super nervous about losing. <laughs> like, at I don't do well under pressure. <laughs> well, you you have the you know. I've been listening to some of the quizzes, and I'm like, I would have probably done well in that. But then some of some of the some of the topics, I'm not so good at. Like, so I'm like, I don't know. We'll see. Well, you'll be defending, you know, the keeping a strong style name, the social suplex chill, name. Chill, chill, <laughs> chill. Uh, so what's Sir Sam saying? So he's saying, big shout out to Josh predicting Keishan Liger months ago. When I heard about that, I immediately went and watched the Muda match, which was very cool. Question is, are there any other examples of altered forms used by wrestlers in NJPW, and how do they match up to Liger? Well, I would say immediately, I think about um, Kensuke Sasaki. He used to be Power Warrior, and he would still bust out the Power Warrior uh, character from time to time. That was uh, you know, his alter ego, and he would team with uh, the Road Warriors, namely Road Warrior Hawk, to be the Hellraisers. That's a pretty popular one. Obviously, Great Muda and uh, Kiji Muto, those were two very distinct characters. Um Trying to think, is there any anyone else I could think of that's like a very unique character? Hmm. Off the top of my head, those are the two that like stick out. I mean, Finn Balor used to break out the different the characters. De- his, yeah, his like demon or whatever. Yeah, Prince Davitt, he Prince Davitt had his different characters. Um I mean when when Tiger Mask One left, he would wrestle under his real name. Um oh God, what's t- the first Tiger Mask name? Uh, Why do I do this all the time? <laughs> um, yeah, and I always I'm I'm not no great remembering his name either. I I can pull it up. I've got it right here. But um, you know he he had alter egos. Um, first uh, Sayama. Guy. Yeah, Satoru Sayama. Satoru Sayama had you know different alter egos, whether it was Tiger Mask or Super Tiger or Tiger King. Um, Kendo Cashin 
um, wrestled under some different names, things like that. But, I mean, I think the really popular ones that just come to mind for me are probably Power Warrior, Great Muda, Keishan Liger, those are the, the, the big ones anyways. Nice. And he also had another side question. He said, also note the, the most immediate streak of international shows are done. What has been your favorite of the overseas cards since they've launched them? Ever? Yeah, I think that's that's how it's kind of phrased. I think ever. Mm. For me, I think the one that, that stands out was, I think it was, it was a strong style evolved when it was the Bucks versus Golden Lovers. Yeah. Um, not the Madison Square Garden show. Yeah, I guess I th- I think about that as a combine as because Ring of Honor was involved too. Well, I just I subtract that the bad <laughs> portion of the show. Yeah, I mean, if you talk about if you just want to talk about the New Japan part of that show, then the Madison Square Garden. Obviously, we were there live. Um, that was a great experience. The the other one, um, yeah, the strong style evolved. Um, I really liked. You know which one I really liked was the Cow Palace show. Uh, which one? With the Cow Palace show with, with Kenny and Cody. Oh, the latter that or hardcore. What? It was just a regular match yeah. that just happened to have a lot of weapons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Kenny and Cody match. And that had uh, Jay White versus Juice Robinson yes, on it. Yes, that was another, yeah, yeah, okay. That was a really good show. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Strong Style Evolve show was really good, too. Yeah. Both of those shows. And the one that I just mentioned, actually, I think the one that I mentioned, the Cow Palace show, is the best one because it also had uh, Hiromu versus... Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee. Yeah. It also had Goto versus um, uh, Jeff Cobb. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that was, was a stack card. That was a yeah, stack yeah. card. That might be one, but that was one that people complained a lot about because it had so many Ring, Ring of Honor guys, and yeah. so many indie guys on it. Um, as far as like full on New Japan shows, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's the, probably the best one. Yeah. Although you know what. The early, early ones, the um, the uh, G one special in USA, the the, the oh two, the US tournament, the US tournament was fire, Very, yeah, was really, really. Kenny's matches in that tournament with, were excellent. Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro. Like that was an incredible tournament. So those, those, yeah, those, those were excellent. All right, so moving on with the rest of this card. Next, we have the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship match. As the champion, Will Ospreay defends against the head banger, the Super J Cup winner, El Phantasmo. Looks like they're about to do another Super J Cup, huh? They're doing a uh, British. Or, I mean, a, Bri- a British Super J yeah, Cup. Yeah, and uh, El, or excuse me, uh, Barbario Cavanario. Barbaro. Barbaro is going to be a part of the uh, Super that uh, Super J Cup or um, British J Cup, unless uh, CMLL pulls him again. Yeah, <laughs> jeez, the freaking company. <laughs> Are we going to talk about that at the end of? The- uh, I did have some, yeah, a, a small update. I mean, there's been a lot going on. There's but, a lot going on over there. Uh, but I do have an update on Dragon Lee and Roosh and a match they take that might indicate some uh, news of where Dragon Lee might end up. Did you listen to Observer this weekend? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah, Will Ospreay, El Fantasma. Well, this is one that's been building for quite a while. This is – how many matches have they had? They had the one match in the um, in the Best of the Super Juniors. Mm-hmm. Have they had another singles match since yep, then? Yeah, the Super J Cup semifinals. That's right. Okay, so this is the third match they've had this year, and it's been building all year. Yeah, there's a, a few that, you know, El Fantasma's come in and – you know, just kind of like Taiji Ishimori the year before, the kind of the new Bullet Club guy, and uh, immediately went to feud with Osprey, and uh, obviously Osprey and ELP had some history, uh, kind of going through Rev Pro, and so they're building something up great. Um, a lot of heat and a lot of momentum behind El Fantasmo, and I mean they're they're making it look like he could potentially win this thing. I mean, he definitely could. Uh, do you see it going that way? I don't think so because I I think Osprey is going to retain, and I think Hiromu is going to come out and challenge Osprey. Yeah, I I know that's your uh, your your opinion, and I would love if they do that. And it, the rumors basically right now are that Hiromu essentially is cleared. Yeah, and so you need something big for the dome if you're going to bring him back. This is the show to kind of do that, and I I think that that's another thing that might really elevate this show. With that being said, though, um. 
how long has Osprey had this title? Uh, when did he win it? Um, he, who did he beat for the title? I don't remember, dude. It's it's been a long. He's had the belt all, majority of this year, so he. Well, he, he was he was the never, never champion. champion. He lost that. Um, was that MSG? He lost that MSG. Yep, to Cobb. Um, so then he won the junior title. Dragon Lee. He won it after the best super juniors. That's right. He won it at Dominion, right? Yep. Gotcha. So yeah, he's he's had the belt for um, quite some time now. Yeah, and it felt like even though even when he wasn't champion, it kind of still felt like he was like he's the top guy in the uh, junior division. So, um, this is kind of a, a make or break match for El Fantasmo, in my opinion. You know, this is the first big big main event or it's not a main event spot but this is the first really big showcase uh match singles match they've given him on one of the top four top five uh shows that they do for the year and no better opponent to do it against other than will osprey these guys have had very good matches in the past um and i think that this is a chance for him to really get over whether he wins or loses yeah so yeah, I think it's a great platform for both of these guys, and I, I just feel I just have that feeling in my my bones with Osprey and Hiromu. I mean, or they could go to El Fantasmo, and then you have Osprey in some kind of heavyweight match. Yeah, Osprey would be freed up at that point, right? But I don't know if I mean they clearly have big plans for El Fantasmo, so I wouldn't be very surprised if they did go with him, and that was kind of like the swan song for Osprey. But it feels like. It feels like I don't. Well, I mean, could you see hypothetically? Do you think it would make sense to do a Phantasmo and um, Hiromu match? I mean, it could make sense. I mean, because um, because instead, instead of doing Osprey and Hiromu, I mean, ELP you have the definitely the big heel, then Hiromu the, this triumphing babyface coming back from injury, and also. He's crazy. He's <laughs> something that Phantasmo has never probably seen or faced before. Right. So there's that. If that's one way, if you want to go the opposite way, and instead of going with two established guys, go with somebody who's not so established but has a lot of star potential, which clearly they see star potential in El Phantasmo. Right. And then um, face him up against one of your most successful and beloved baby faces. Plus. He's the he's the guy that could easily take that fall to a returning Hiromu, which I gotta imagine if he's coming back, he's probably winning. Right. So that's a possibility, but I don't know. I think I like the Osprey story a little bit better. Right. And Phantasmo's already beaten Osprey twice now in singles matches. That make, yeah. They had the successful junior tag tile defense against Birds of Prey. Uh, so I think Osprey needs to get something back here. In, um, and, you know, New Japan's all about that 50-50 booking. Right, that 50-50 life. You know, the, the reality is, deep down, the truth is, they really do do 50-50 booking. They just do it over way longer periods of time. Right. And it's not like... It's not like you're getting, like, 10 matches back to back to back. Yeah, to yeah, back. yeah. You're going to get, like, three to four within a year. Yeah. So, but yeah. But so. I, think, I think that this match definitely... Has match of the night potential? Oh, definitely. Especially, I don't know how true it's going to be, but Phantasmo did say no shigan- no shenanigans, no That's cheating. Bullshit. That's bullshit. He's going to wrestle clean. Bullshit. <laughs> also, like, I don't care. I, I, I really don't care if people don't like th- I still don't like Phantasmo. Well, I love me some ELP. I actually just got me an ELP shirt from what? Pro Wrestling Tees. You're a mark. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. So, yeah. I'm loving El Phantasmo, man. I think he's been great this year. El Phantasmo is like the girl that I don't like. And Will Ospreay is like the girl that I really like who doesn't like me back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, yeah. So, I, I think I'm going Osprey for final prediction. I, I'll take Osprey as well. I think this match could be fantastic. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And, I mean, look at how, bro, two matches in, how freaking, it, like two singles matches in. Liger Suzuki, then Osprey Phantasmo. Tell me that this is not a stacked card. Yeah. Right? Uh, so next we have another title match. We have the a rematch. Yes, the IWGP US Championship match as the champion, John Moxley, the Deaf Rider, be taking on the flamboyant Juice Robinson. They wrestled in the G One, right? Yes, Juice beat Mox. Why don't I remember this match in my mind? I don't know. We reviewed it. I saw it. I watched it. I don't remember it. 
Right. So you had the. I remember the first match. Yeah, the best of the Super Junior Finals, which was the better match. I know which, the second match happened. I don't remember it. Dude, because we've seen so much wrestling That's so since weird. then. <laughs> and I have, I have such a good memory usually, too. So it's really strange. But um, I'm very excited for this. Right. If it's anything like the the first like the second match was good. But that first match at the best of Super Junior Finals was just was awesome. So if it's anything like that, then I think this is another match that could potentially be match of the night and seal the show. Um, this is going to be uh, like a street fight, right? That's right. No disqualifications. No yeah. yeah. So that really opens things up quite a bit too, which is interesting because if my prediction is right and Liger and Suzuki ends up being a very violent all over the fight, all over the arena brawl, you got to imagine that that's what Mox and Juice are going to do as well. Right, but maybe Mox and Juice will have more like tables, more like more like kind of your you know American hardcore match spots, and then Liger Suzuki will just kind of like be throwing each other into stuff. No, I'm expecting Liger and Suzuki to, like bust out barbed wire, <laughs> flaming tables, <laughs> thumbtacks, light tubes, you know, all, all the good stuff. Yeah, but yeah, man, fire extinguisher. <laughs> uh, yeah, this has the potential to be a, a, a great match up here. Um, I think I think Mox and Juice has been my favorite match that Mox has had in this company. I know for most people they probably prefer what like the Ishii match. Yeah, but I I still think that the Mox Juice match is my favorite John Moxley match this year, and I think that might be my favorite Juice match this year. So I'm very excited for this matchup, and um, I think Juice is winning the title. You know, originally I was thinking that I was like, he's gonna get his win. He's gonna send John to just to focus on AEW. But with him, with Moxley saying he wants to be at Wrestle Kingdom, I could see him walking into Wrestle Kingdom as the U.S. champion and having another big match with somebody. I could too, and um, you know, they could definitely do that. But it sort of feels. A little Cody-ish to me. It's like, oh, I'm going to carry the title all the way to Wrestle Kingdom, drop it, and then we know his contract is up then. Now, whether they extend it, whether they sign a new one, that's that remains to be seen, but I think that kind of sucks. I, w- I actually could see John Moxley going into Wrestle Kingdom, Sans title, and Juice picks up the big win here. I think Juice needs it. Yeah, Juice does need it, yeah. I think, I think if they're smart, they, they've done the right thing by Moxley. They put him over... In a very big way this year, they've given him a lot of big, important victories, made him a big star. I mean, he's he was already a big star, but they've done done right by him in Japan. Um, I, now, if he wins, I won't be surprised. I won't be shocked. There would be. There's been already this year way more shocking decisions. So it's not the worst decision in the world. Could John Moxley retain the title? Absolutely. Is that the wrong decision? No, probably not. But I think for for the company. Your real investment is your guy. And who's their guy? It's Juice. Don't do this to Juice. They yeah. they should probably put Juice over here. Yeah, man, you, you swayed me back. So, yeah, I think I'll go with, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with Juice winning here. <laughs> I just I just think it's I think it's a misstep. If you if you don't put over Juice, I mean, I mean, there's the other way of looking at it and be like, Juice will always be here and, and Mox won't. But I'm kind of like, well, you built up Mox for Juice, right? Just do it, do it. It's time. Let's let's go. I'm excited for this match. I think it's gonna be great. Yeah. So next up, we have the match for uh, the Russell Kingdom title shot as Kota Ibushi defends his contract against Evil. Yeah. Um, this is this is gonna be good. It's gonna be hard hitting. Yeah. Based off what I've seen from the New York match and the New Japan Road match and their G1 match, I feel this is going to be a really h- snug, hard-hitting match. Um, I think Abushi's going to be taking a bunch of flat neck bumps here. I think they're going to tease that everything is evil since evil's beat him with it twice now. I think they're going to do a great job. Actually, well, probably three times because they beat him with the G1 also. So they're going to they're going to tease that so well. Um, there's going to be a lot of great near falls in this match, but obviously uh, the golden star will rise here and defeat evil. I agree. His star will shine bright in the darkness, <laughs> in the darkness world. Yeah, I think it's going to be really good. I think Ibushi, 
obviously is going to be the I think he's the obvious winner here. I, I can't imagine the G one winner losing his uh his briefcase or his uh contract and title opportunity to evil. Right. Uh, I just can't see that there, happening. There's no way they're going into Wrestle Kingdom the biggest Wrestle Kingdom in history with evil as the challenger. Not right now. Totally agree. But with that being said, at the same time, these guys have had fantastic matches uh, against one another. And um, I think in the semi-main event in Ryugoku, with how popular Evil is getting, this is going to be a good match. Yeah. Then we have the main event of the evening for the IWGP heavyweight title. And for the fifth time this year. <laughs> the champion, Kazuchika Okada, defends against Cold Skull Sanada. Hot take. Everyone who complained about uh, Tanahashi and Sabre, they need to be complaining about Okada Sonata. <laughs> um, and to be honest with you, I like both series, so I'm not really complaining. But between the two, I preferred the Tanahashi and Sabre matches to the Okada Sonata matches. Bro, I'm right there with you. By a smidge. Not by a lot, but those those matches were shorter. They were always a little bit different, and they always kind of kept my attention, whereas the Okada Sonata matches, as good as they are, they've tended to be very, very long. Yeah, super long New Japan main event style kind of matches. Yeah, they're they're like, they're the very long Okada matches, which, you know, give me Jay White for 15 minutes in the dome. <laughs> <laughs> But no, uh, I am I'm looking forward to this actually though. Yeah, this should be, you know, a very I mean all their t- matches this year have been great. This should be another great one. The the interactions and the multi-man matches have been great as well. So I'm expecting a, another great match here with Okada retaining. Actually, yeah, Okada retaining. Okada's got to retain. He's going to retain, but like I mentioned, I think either last week or two weeks ago, I think this is going to be a 60-minute draw. And that kind of plays into our question from Rambo and Slam Pig, do you guys think Gato might pull the trigger? On a time limit draw in the Okada versus Sonata match as a way of continuing the build to Sonata as a legitimate threat without moving the title from Okada. And I said that a couple weeks ago. I think they are going to go for the the 60-minute time limit draw here and protect Sonata. Uh, You know, he he didn't eat a Rainmaker. and He didn't get pinned. But at the same time, he couldn't beat Okada. And it leaves the door open, like, what would happen if he had more time? Not to be disparaging of Kazuchika Okada, because I still think he's one of the most fantastic workers and wrestlers in the world, but this title reign is not of the same caliber as his previous title reigns. Again, not to disparage him, because it's been a fantastic title reign, but when you compare it to the legendary one that he had previous to this, it's not the same caliber. And the one he had previous to that, not the same caliber. Um, And I think that Part of that is, like, he's still having fantastic matches, but at the same time, there's this sense that it's not... He's not riding that crest of popularity and that wave of greatness that he was just a year or two prior to this. And a lot of that is wrapped up in this Sonata feud. I mean, again, this is the fifth time this calendar year that these guys have wrestled. Am I That's right, right? Yeah. So they wrestled... Or is it the fourth? So the rest of New Japan Cup, um, New Beginning, G1. So I think this would be... It wasn't New Beginning. They had New Japan Cup, Sakura Genesis. That's what I meant, Sakura Genesis, my bad. G1. Okay, this is our fourth match this year? I think so. Yeah, I think that's right. Either way, that's a lot. That's a lot. Like, um... So these guys have faced off. I feel like it was five, though. Because the first match was New Japan Cup, right? In yeah. March? Yes. Because then Okada won, and mm-hmm. he won the title, and he picked Sonata as his challenger for Secure Genesis. Mm-hmm. He beat Sonata there. And then he lost at the G1. Right. So this is their fourth match this year. Yeah. Okay, that's right. That's right. But even still, um, I think it would be a fitting thing if Okada were to like go 60 minutes with Sonata because it kind of shows two things like Okada, even though he's maintaining his spot, he's not demolishing people the way that maybe he has in the past. You know, he's kind of getting past his opponents Mm -hmm. as opposed, he's not like um, dominating them. And Sonata being a guy who's kind of slowly, but surely crept up on him. It would show where in their 
rivalry and where in his uh, skill level they are in comparison to one another. I got to tell you, I'm not, I'm not hoping for a 60 minute match. <laughs> um, be, only because Okada and Sonata could probably have a fantastic 60 minute draw. And I, I love me a 60 minute draw when it's good, but I don't like when it's obvious. This feels kind of telegraphed and I don't like when it's telegraphed in the match to where the pace is slow and Okada and Sonata tend to wrestle somewhat slow paces I can appreciate that when it's telling a good story, and they do. They've got sound psychology, but we've seen a lot of that. Their matches have been very similar all year, and that's one of the drawbacks. It's like you kind of know what's going to happen between them, and I, that's something that's hard for me. It's like uh, I know it. I like I kind of have to prepare myself. It's like I know it's going to be a long match. Yeah. So yeah, we'll we'll see what happens there. Obviously, we're both going with Okada retaining the title. I think Okada is going to beat him. Yeah, I think or, or not not a draw. I hope it's not. I I think Okada is going to beat him. Um, I think Sina- if you want my opinion, I think you go the opposite way. I think you have a shorter match than the other matches they've had, but you do it in a way to where it's more high octane. Get Sonata over by having a great match, not. Not one that's built on a very, very, very long story, but one where Okada goes, okay, I lost in the G1 because I went too deep with this guy. Right, I need to put him away quick. Urgency. And Sonata stick, sticks with him toe-to-toe, and they have, they need to have, like, the same match, like, a similar match to what Okada and Kenny had in the G1. Like, a freaking, like... That sprint, yeah. They need a sprint. I would like if this was a sprint. 20 minutes max. Boom, 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 boom. Fast action, big big moves. I think Sonata would get over more in a match like that with Okada. Than the 60 than minute. Like, oh, he went 60 minutes. He's so skilled. No, nah, dog, show us your skills. <laughs> Let's get these clips going. We, I know Sonata can do it. Let's see it. Yeah. Do it. That's what I want. And I think Okada's going to rainmaker him, put him away. Nice. Uh, so we have a question here from Jersey Joe Gotch. says, are we ever going to get a Sonata break from LIJ and a singles run as a baby face for Sonata? Yeah. That's my answer. Yes. Eventually <laughs> that is going to happen. When? They're building for it. They're yeah. building for it. I think it's sooner rather than later. Mm. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't be doing this. Yeah. But I, I definitely think it's going to be a singles run, but you think they'll completely break him away from LIJ? I don't know if those are going to coincide with one another at the same time. I could see him having a singles run while still in LIJ. But yeah. eventually, yeah, he's going to break off. Nothing lasts forever. Yeah. Diamonds are forever. So is Ric <laughs> Flair. Uh, so we have a couple off-topic questions here, and then we will jump into the news. Uh, first from uh, Dom Homie 101 He says, besides the obvious big AEW names, who are some AEW talent that you guys want to see in a New Japan ring? Mm. Who's over in that company? <laughs> uh, Isla Rose. <laughs> uh, Everyone see. complains about there not being women in New Japan. We need her over here. Yeah, uh, Aja Kong. <laughs> yeah, let's just bring their whole their whole women's divi- the women's division in. Rio, awesome Kong. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know i I don't know who wrestles in AEW. I don't know. Let's see. I mean, I would love to see Hangman Page. I mean, he had a good G one that year. Nah, we are I, we already seen him. <laughs> I, as, far, as far as somebody new, I want Pac. Oh, there you go. That's who I want. Yeah, Pac would be interesting. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Uh, I think my list starts and ends with Pac. That like I can't think of anyone else I really, really, really want that they have. Yeah, like there's nobody that I think that's. I mean, obviously I gotta want Kenny back, but obviously he's been there. I mean, obviously it'd be great to uh, get the Bucks back, but once again, you know they've been there. I mean, if you really were like so inclined and you're like, I really want to do tag team wrestling in New Japan. I mean, there's a lot of great tag teams over there, so there's that. But like, I don't yeah. know. SCU doesn't do much for me. I'm not. Like, uh, Darby Allen would be interesting in a junior role. Darby and the best of Super Juniors, maybe. For uh, some reason, I'm not high on that either. In Lucha Lucha Brothers, Phoenix and Pentagon. Oh, hell yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, yeah. They would be great in there. Let's see, scrolling through the roster, see if there's. A, I mean, Luchasaurus. I I think 
could be pretty cool in New Japan. He'd probably get over. Yeah. I I don't think I'm so into that, but yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean in my mind, I just think of all the tag teams. I think of like LAX, Private Party, Best Friends. Best, well, They've been there, yeah. yeah. But like, if I was if I was thinking of singles guys, those three guys: Phoenix, Pentagon, um, uh, Pac. Those are the, like Pac. Fuck that. His name's Pop. <laughs> yeah, you don't get to change it after so all these years and be like, actually, it's Pac. <laughs> no, dog, it's Pac. We know it's Pac. I don't care. All right. So uh, next question. I, I wish I had a. Be- I wish we had like. I wish we were more excited. To be honest with you, I I, w- I don't really want an AW partnership. Yeah, honestly, like, I just want New Japan to focus on them, and for the Western expansion to. If you're going to do shows here, like, I don't, yes, it'd be awesome to have Kenny and those guys back in New Japan, but. And when we say Kenny and those guys, what we're really saying is we want to see the Bucks and we want to see Kenny in the New Japan ring, and that's about it. Like, I, I, I wish they never left. Right. But other than that, and I know that there are other people who disagree with that. There's people literally on, who are like, we don't need them. But, like, I miss them. But other than that. I like Cody, but I don't need Cody in a New Japan ring. Right. I, I, I really like Hangman, but I don't need him. I don't need I, most. Well, of the, what about uh, Bellator's undefeated Jake Hager? I think Jake Hager could actually do really well in New Japan, to be honest with you. I think he's one of the few guys that they would probably utilize correctly and do something cool with, I bet. Mm. Anokiism. Anokiism. Anokiism is alive and well, sir. Speaking of that, hey, that's, that kind of leads into one of our questions <laughs> uh, from Twitter follower at QBISTE. says, do you have any thoughts about the return of Anokiism in, re- w- in WWE? The return of Anokiism? It never left, sir. <laughs> where, where, where did it go? Did you forget that Ronda Rousey headlined WrestleMania this past year? Brock Lesnar has been on the top of the card since 2012. Where did Inokiaism ever go? Well, it's, it's been there alive and well. It's it's stronger now. Oh, it's much stronger. Uh, Kane Velasquez and Tyson Fury. Can you believe that this past Friday that Kane Velasquez walked out and they didn't say, that's got to be, that's got to be Kane. Yeah, they, they dropped the ball on that one. Who would miss that call? Yeah. I would. I would. I know I wouldn't be a good commentator, but I would never miss. That I would call. have gone rogue. I know Vince probably wouldn't. I've been, I, <laughs> it's gotta be. It's gotta be gang. Listen, I was with friends, and um, <laughs> one of my friends, she was like, Dominic got big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny because. <laughs> Because I was watching it, and initially like, I heard Ray's music, and I was like, oh, Ray and Dominic, are they going to come, come, come jump jump him? And then Ray came out, and then I was like, wait a minute, that's Cain Blasquez. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, I I love Enochism, and I'm glad it's alive and well in the WWE. It's great. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't, you know, I don't follow WWE, so I don't know really. Like, I couldn't give you a good, uh, you know. I, honestly, can, I couldn't tell you. I don't care. Like, honestly, I don't care. Like, Cain Blasquez is not a draw for me. They're good. They're I want him to come to New Japan. Like I'd like him to get better as a wrestler first before he goes on and tries to have some big match. Uh, I saw him doing high spots in Mexico. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> and then that match is probably happening at Crown Jewel. I've never watched any of those Crown <laughs> Jewel. Any of those Saudi shows, so I don't care about that match. And honestly, I've watched one match from those Saudi shows. Yeah, the, uh, the Goldberg Taker. The Goldberg Taker. <laughs> Uh, King's Road special That is literally King's Road at its zenith Yeah and I don't care about Tyson Fury going against Br- uh, Braun Strowman either so It's not for me I really like Tyson Fury now, He's cool but I mean I don't know I'm, I've never been a big fan of the boxers Coming he, in Not 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 Ali I mean I was young When Ali came in I mean, Not Mike Tyson it, Tyson was cool but he didn't have a match though. He was an enforcer Buster Douglas knocked out uh, Randy Sa- Randy Savage on uh, Saturday night's main event. I d- I didn't know that. It's great. It's great. <laughs> and then uh, Floyd Money Mayweather knocking out Big Show. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, Vander Holyfield had a match with Matt Hardy. They boxed. Remember? They did. Yeah, on Saturday night's main event in like 2008, and MVP was in uh, Vander Holyfield's corner. Oh my gosh, that <laughs> did happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. A former IWGP Intercontinental <laughs> Champion, ladies the, and gentlemen. The first. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, 
So uh, next question comes from Twitter follower at Chris underscore ERTZ. Have you guys watched the G129 documentary Vanishing Point that went up on NJPW's YouTube channel this week? And if so, what did you think of it? Unfortunately, Chris, I did not have a chance to watch I this, seen this documentary yet. Um, I did see it pop up on New, New Japan's YouTube. I just haven't had what a chance to watch it yet. I'm guessing it's like a, it's a documentary about G, the whole G1 tournament this year. Uh, Vanishing Point, that's a weird name. Yeah, I have not checked it out yet, so... That'll be homework for me uh, this week. I'll watch it, and uh, next week I'll come back and give you thoughts about the documentary. Man. Oh, speaking of, I thought of some more. Speaking of boxers and wrestling, one time, um, freaking, uh, God, did you watch that match with us where uh, Takata kicked the crap out of that boxer? Yes. In UWF? Yeah. <laughs> Who was it? It was not Leon Spinks. It was, um, God, what was his name? Trevor Berbick. They didn't tell Trevor Berbick. They told Trevor Berbick it was a uh, it was a work, and then Takata who was shooting. He <laughs> shot on him. <laughs> oh, uh, good stuff. Also, you know Roberto Duran fought in UWF. I don't know who Roberto Duran is. He's like the greatest lightweight of all time. Uh, I <laughs> dude, I really don't follow boxing. I, honestly, I hate boxing. <laughs> what you do? I think boxing is so boring. You're boring. You know nothing. <laughs> you know nothing. It's my favorite. It's my favorite sport. <laughs> My favorite sport is pro wrestling. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, yeah. But anyway, so um, I got to see. Yeah, I'll check out this documentary. Yep. Sounds uh, intriguing. I don't know what to, I don't know what it is. but Yeah. All I know is, is about G129. Nice. Uh, so moving on to the news now. So we had Sports Illustrating reporting that Chris Jericho versus Roshi Tanahashi for January 4th at the Tokyo Dome is the matchup. And uh, Dave Meltzer kind of said... He knows that Jericho versus Tanahashi was always the plan for the Dome. The only question is which night. So it looks like we're getting some more kind of concrete report reporting behind this that Jericho Tanahashi is actually going to happen. Who is Sports Illustrated's source is what I want to know. I don't, you want to know everybody's <laughs> source. <laughs> oh, man. I got to be fair. I got to be fair. <laughs> no, but um, I mean, that. yeah, that makes that makes sense. They built it up. You know, earlier this year at Dominion, um, I don't know that that's a match that I'm super excited for, but uh, you know, that's a guy Jericho wants to work with. I know Tanahashi wants to work with him, so yeah. And they already did the angle, so bro, Jericho would have to go over if he's still the champion. I bet. Yeah, I know. Uh, Rich and I have been joking that uh, Jericho's going to get that mini tournament. He's going to be the AEW champion, then he's going to win both those belts to create. And then he's also going to win uh, the U.S. belt from Moxley to create the Quadruple Crown Championship. You guys are stupid. <laughs> um, I didn't want to joke about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Let's next, move on. Let's move on. <laughs> so we uh, talked about um, the Suzuki report coming from Voices of Wrestling. On that same episode of the flagship, they also mentioned that Harold May could be potentially leaving New Japan as well. And he would be leaving New Japan, but he would still be an executive of Bushi, of Bushi Road. That's bullshit. That's bullshit, bro. Because, listen, I saw that man, Dominion, 20, 2018. <laughs> that man he got a call from the president. He took a shower. He came running down the aisle like he was the freaking ultimate warrior. He welcomed us to a new era. If he leaves... I'm canceling my New Japan World subscription. This show is done. No more New Japan Pro Wrestling. No more, <laughs> no more keeping a strong style. It's over. Yeah, I felt that. <laughs> so what's the deal? Why is he leaving? What's... I don't, there haven't been any kind of details to why he would potentially be leaving. I have no idea. But Maybe because for... he sucks? <laughs> <laughs> you know, clearly he's had a kind of a role in the Western expansion and... I don't know what that would mean for the Western expansion with him leaving. We do have several questions here ask, kind of asking about that. Uh, first from Reddit user Brian James Interactive. Should New Japan simply take the difficult decision to stop the Western expansion outside of a couple shows per year outside of Japan? It is clear that the interest from the West has dropped off dramatically and per perhaps the investment egg should be being placed in different basket. I just want to let everybody know I was just joking about Harold May sucking. <laughs> I don't know if he sucks. He probably is pretty good. Um, Harold, if you're listening, just 
give us that check. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if they should make the difficult decision to totally stop the expansion. Um, well, he said outside of a couple shows per year. That might be a good. That might be a good move. I don't know. Right. I mean, we I'm talk- not a business analyst. We talked about it last week on our, our opinion of the Western expansion and what they should do. I think less is more with the Western expansion. I think you focus on building that that quality stream, the accessibility of watching the show. I say you do four big shows in the U.S. a year, spread them out, make them special, make them huge shows, make sure they're broadcast, make sure you have English commentary, and that that will help. Yeah, I mean, it's really, um, I don't know, man. I think of it this way. How many sports leagues are international? You know? Yeah. Like, none? You know, the NFL is in America, MLB's here, Japan has their sports leagues. Even you look at soccer, there's, t- I mean, FIFA is a conglomeration of all these different clubs and all these different leagues. I mean, how realistic is it that someone's going to be a worldwide force? Usually, that is accomplished through distribution, more so than anything else, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, good friend of the show, Ricky, he's a big NFL fan. It's not because they're playing that in Glasgow. You know, it's because he's watching it because it's distributed. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I think it's very ambitious what they've tried to do up to this point, but I don't know. I think that it's a good idea to maybe, like he said, try to invest in, maybe maybe try to diversify, maybe try to get this product in front of more viewers, more eyes abroad in different countries, not just America. As much as I love what they've done, at, you know, here in North America and all that's great, Um but I don't know. I don't know how much that plays in Harold Mai's decision to potentially step down, or if it's even true. Because at this point, I'm, I am, even though I, it's coming from a reputable source, I'm going to call it a rumor at this point. Yeah, I don't, I don't see enough to substantiate it. It's just, you know, something that's being reported on. It's not, right. it's, it's not uh, confirmed. Um, but yeah, I mean, we met Harold May. Yeah, we did. Yeah, he gave me a sticker. He's a nice man. <laughs> Yeah, so be interesting to see where what happens here. Uh, next question here from Reddit user Viking Payne. He says, "Hey guys, loving your podcast. Have you guys heard the rumors about Suzuki and May? If May leaves, will that hinder the American expansion? And also, isn't May the guy that the elite had problems with? Because as much as I hate to say it, with all the turmoil involving ROH and CMLL, and with Harold May possibly leaving, I think a NJPW AEW alliance is a real possibility now." Well couple things about that. Um, We have heard about the rumors. We're talking about them now. We appreciate the compliment. Um, I don't know if it hinders the expansion. In fact, who knows? It maybe even could make it better, possibly. I mean, they started the expansion without him. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know. The whole thing with Harold May was that he was supposed to be this, you know, fantastic, you know, growth guy, someone who had a history in international markets and international business and had a uh, experience in that way where most like uh, Japanese, like, um, you know, I don't know the word is like board members didn't, you know, he'd expanded those toy companies, which is kind of what his background was. And he kind of knew how to navigate those international business waters. That was kind of supposed to be his role. Um, Who's to say that he hasn't been, very beneficial for the U.S. expansion. He may have been. We don't really know enough about it. Now, I will say this. While I did hear some slight rumors about Harold May having issues with the elite, it appeared that most of the reports actually dealt more with Michael, Michael Craven, Craven yeah. than Harold May. Um, and I actually remember reading reports where Harold May had sat down and had dinner with like Kenny, and they were very impressed with what he was proposing at the time. Um, what led to that, I don't know, but ultimately, obviously, the the elite are gone. So, um, you know, with him leaving, I don't know if him leaving creates a possibility of a New Japan AEW alliance or anything like that. I don't, I don't know if that really has any bearing on it. I mean, if if he's still an executive with Bushi Road, I'm sure he's going to have some sort of level of power. I would have right, yeah, some kind some of kind action. of yeah decision. I will say this though. After watching, we did. I did watch the first AEW show the other day, and even though from a fan standpoint, there's not a lot going on in AEW that I'm like, oh god, I want to see them team up with New Japan. 
Um, there is a part of me that's like having them team up with the the big major league company in North America, other than WWE, does make a lot of business sense. Yeah, possibly. And, you know, Okada is very good from with the Bucks, so it'd be great to get Okada on a, a AEW pay per view or episode of Dynamite. Yeah, I mean, we, we it still remains to be seen where this company is going, but so far so good. They had a very successful debut episode. It looked fantastic. Oh on the yeah, the presentation was awesome. Yeah, their pre- their presentation was awesome. I just I I wonder. I don't think New Japan can work with a company like that. To be to be honest with you, I don't think New Japan is used to being the B side, mm-hmm. and I don't think they would allow themselves to be. And I don't. I think there's a lot of egos in play here. I don't think that, uh, given everything that happened with the way they left the company, I don't think the elite are going to let themselves be treated like the B side either. Right. And so I think there's a fundamental. You know, break point there. I don't think they're going to work together. Yeah, not everybody wants it, but it's just one of the things I don't think is going to happen. I mean, they're clear competitors, even though they're in different markets. Like they are the top two companies outside of WWE in the world. I think it, it'd be very hard for them to work together. Right, and I mean, the birth of AEW pretty much was the start of the decline of the Western popularity in, in, for New Japan, and also like the death knell for their major U.S partner in roh so yeah yeah it's not been good (laughs) (laughs) uh next question from reddit user tiny underscore sausage underscore factory um says in relation to the rumors of people leaving njpw is there any current wrestler whose departure from njpw would make you check out the promotion they went to yeah if okada left wherever he went i would go Oh, definitely yeah okada um, Uh, he'll never leave but if like immediately if if okada left no matter where he went, I would watch it. Abushi. Abushi's been lots of places where I didn't watch. I, don't know, I feel that right now he's at a level where if he left, I would want to see where he's going. It depends on where he went because Abushi likes to do some bullshit. <laughs> he, he likes to have uh, matches some, in the street. He does some weird <laughs> shit. And so, like, if, if Abushi's like wrestling in some small little, I'm probably not going to catch that. Right. Um, Trying to think who else. Um, Osprey. Yeah, but then again, Osprey wrestles a lot of places where I kind of catch what is highly recommended, but I don't follow him. Like I, I, you know, I'm not an adamant progress r- watcher or Rev Pro or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the only way I would really watch those guys is if they went to like a major promotion. Then that would be intriguing to me. But I could see them going off and doing some smaller stuff. But, like, literally for me, if Okada went anywhere, anywhere, I would watch it. He could be wrestling in some backyard wrestling promotion. It doesn't matter. GCW. <laughs> it doesn't matter where <laughs> Okada goes. I'm going to watch it. And it's not even that, like, I'm a fan of Okada like that. Like, I am a fan of Okada, but he's the best in the world. So it doesn't matter where he went. I'd have to see it. Yeah. And with the star power that he has, it's it'll probably be somewhere major than minor. But, but we're just talking because I really don't think he's ever leaving. Right, clearly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tanahashi. I would watch Tanahashi no matter where he went. Yeah. No, like, period. The ace, man. There's very few guys that, like, if they leave, if there are guys, if they leave New Japan, I would probably check out a match or two or something like that. But um, if Okada or Tanahashi leave, it, then I'd probably start watching wherever what they about, go. What uh, about Ishii? Um, probably not. Mm. I, I would I would check it. it it's kind of the same for me. I, I really like Ishii. Suzuki's kind of the same way too. Like I'm not gonna like catch every single Big Japan show just because he's there. You know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that wraps that up. Uh, next news item: Hirai Kawato and Tomioka Oka. So there's been some kind of news surfing uh, sur- uh, surfacing about these two young lions. That have been on excursion. So Kawato, uh, it's been reported by the Wrestling Observer that um, he returned home to Japan because he was ill, and that the illness must be serious because uh, he's been, Dave's been told that he it's not certain if he'll wrestle again. But our friends over the Super J Cast got some news that the illness is not that serious. So some kind of conflicting reports What's there. Your source. <laughs> that's that's the, the, the the theme of today. Who's the source <laughs> behind all these news stories? Um, and then with Oka, you know, he kind of disappeared. Um, 
being in Ref Pro and uh, Super J Cast said that he had some um, family issues and he went back home to be with family. But uh, just today, uh, there was a picture of Oka that resurfaced with him over at uh, Rev Pro with a full head of hair in the great Okarn gimmick. So it looks like whatever issues he was dealing with is clear for now and he's back in action. Yeah. Um, and we had a question here from Reddit user Jai Bryan. With everything going on in CMLL right now, would you bring Kawato back and have him join the main roster or just send him to the UK slash LA dojo? Um, I don't know. I think that's something that they'd have to uh, gauge for themselves depending on where they think he is in his progression and what their goals are for him. Um, I, I couldn't say with any certainty one way or another. But I did want to mention something. We talked about these guys leaving for excursion the last few weeks, but we didn't mention explicitly. I think we briefly talked about it, but you notice they they didn't send anybody to Mexico. Right, yeah. And then it sent anybody, anybody to ROH. ROH. Yeah. But they sent somebody to to the UK to work RevPro. I think that that's very telling about these uh, potential partnerships. Right. And like we mentioned when we were talking about the excursions, like CMLL has been a prime spot for the last few years now for some of their top young lines. So it is kind of questioning with Narita and Umino, two of their top guys, that they wouldn't send one of those guys yeah. to Mexico. Yeah, it's a little surprising. I mean, at the time, I didn't think much about it because I was like, they had two people, they had two places to send them. This kind of makes sense. But now, given ev- all the all the news surrounding these two other companies that they have strong ties to and have been there, traditionally speaking, the two places where they usually do send people on excursion and they didn't send anybody there, I think there's, I think it's a little telling. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Oka and Kawato, how much longer they'll both be on excursion. And here's, here's the thing is like, I hope it works out with one of those guys or both of them, because you look at the rest of that class and it's all, they're, they're all Kanemitsu's gone. Um, Kitamura. Yagi, Kitamura's gone. Yagi. Yagi. It's, it's literally a lost class at this point. And um, these are, these are the last two guys. Yeah. And I mean, these are the guys we had high hopes for. Very high hopes for it. And it hasn't been looking so good based on just the reports and everything we've been seeing. So, you know, hopefully Kawato gets back to full health and he can continue wrestling. And then we've seen Oka resurface. Hopefully uh, he can pick um, back up in Rev Pro. And then sooner or later we can get these guys back home. Yeah. So next new story, we had some comments from Ed Nordholm, who is running both Impact and Access, did an interview with PW Insider. And he gave a lot more of a vote of confidence to New Japan. And wow, he says, well, New Japan is wrestling. We enjoy it on Access TV and look forward to continuing that relationship. I think I've said it a couple times since we've acquired access to anyone accent between New Japan and women of wrestling. So based off this interview with PW Insider, it sounds like uh, Ed Norholm wants to kind of turn access into a wrestling channel with impact. New Japan and Wow. I don't trust them. <laughs> no, I'm not even joking. I really don't like show show me where you are invested in New Japan by putting on these U.S. shows and investing in the company the same way Axis did previously, and um, start talking about how you want to prolong the relationship that you have long term plans, and then maybe maybe I'll believe it. Right now, this just sounds like lip service. Like these guys are signed to a contract till 2021. Obviously, they're not going to. Uh, disparage their own you know property that they have under their banner until that time period but i have a feeling right now that when 2021 comes around they're gone Uh, until i see otherwise that's what i think yeah um like you said yeah it could just be kind of a a lip service kind of thing just to keep the peace until the contract is up but you know because like you said if if they were really invested in new japan like they would have had probably had access help out with like the Super J Cup and um, the Fighting Spirit Unleashed and you know the upcoming uh, LA shows. So yeah, I, yeah. Maybe they maybe they just want to have them as a, a distribution product. They don't want them to, you know, do US shows because right. technically speaking, if you think about it, they are competition to Impact and they're right. on the same network. That's weird stuff. 
unless, you know, there's also been rumors of potentially Impact trying to form a relationship with New Japan, then you can do co-branded shows. Um, that That's a possibility, but again, I don't know if New Japan would want to work with Impact, so. We'll see. So, yeah, we'll keep you updated if we hear anything else on the... Ultimately, like, you know, partnerships are all well and good, but at the end of the day, these are all companies that are competing for the same market share. Right. It's still business. So, uh, next in the news, Will Ospreay has tweeted out that the elevated theme will be heard next Monday at King of Pro Wrestling. So, I'm guessing whatever copyright deal, they got it figured out, and we'll be able to hear elevated next Monday. We made a call. <laughs> we call we called Harold. We're like, yo, bring it back, dog. Like, was, we like that theme. And they're like, all right, we got you. <laughs> um, fans can now see the first four nights of G One Climax Twenty Nine with French commentary. What on NJPW World? Yo, why haven't we watched this yet? Let's, <laughs> we gotta watch this immediately. <laughs> uh, so, if we have any French listeners out there, if you know anybody who speaks French, they can start watching the G One in French. So. Pretty interesting. Well, I mean, you know, we talked last year about them having a French television deal, so right. that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, New Japan is going to be partnering with Anytime Fitness to do a charity squat session at uh, King of Pro Wrestling. You can check out more information about that on NJPW1972.com. Can I participate by going to my Anytime Fitness and just doing a lot of squats? Uh, I think it's mainly supposed to be in Japan, but I, I'm sure... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Anton Fitness and be like, yo, I'm here for the King of Pro Wrestling <laughs> squat challenge for charity. And I'm just start hitting like Hindu squats. <laughs> yeah. This is for you, Suzuki. <laughs> uh, the Monday free match is uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi versus Hiroki Goto from Destruction. And also we had uh, NJPW being represented. It's going to be represented at the Destroyer Memorial Night on November 15th. In Oda City Gymnasium on November 15th, a special memorial car will be held to remember Destroyer Dick Beyer, a legendary figure in global professional wrestling and Japanese pop culture, who passed away in March at the age of 88. The main event is going to see Jushin Thunder Liger, Kijimoto, and Kento Miyahara take on Sonata, Bushi, and Kai. And then in other news with Dragon Lee and Roish, uh, last week we talked a lot about um, them being fired from CMLL and just kind of what that means for the future of Dragon Lee and Roosh and where they will be wrestling. Um, you know, they've, they've done a press conference kind of talking about what has happened with CMLL and w- what their kind of plans are for the future. Dragon Lee has been making it very clear that nothing is going to get in the way of him uh, wrestling Hiromu again, and he wants to wrestle for new japan on his twitter he said that he's going to be making a big announcement very soon however there has been something very interesting so for the uh, anniversary show for the crash that is happening in november it's going to be dragon lee and Rouge taking on pentagon and phoenix and um lucha blog uh the cubs fan uh, kind of tweeted out, if this match is really happening, that would mean Dragon Lee is now out of the NJPW Junior Heavyweight Tag Team lead, and this would put his future with NJPW into question. But then he later tweeted that he was told that this is not something to, to worry about. But it, it's going to be kind of interesting what happens with Dragon Lee, and if he does end up signing a full-time contract with New Japan, I'm sure there are or all the American promotions are going to want to reach out to Dragon Lee and try and get him signed. Um, so, you know, Dragon Lee, there's posters out with him and Teton are supposed to be in the Super Junior Tag Tournament. Well, they said he's out. I heard today that he's not in the Junior Tag League. Where'd you hear that? I just, I read it. Mm. I don't, I, I wish I had it. Uh, where's, where, where's your source, Josh? <laughs> uh, read it. <laughs> <laughs> junior. Uh, it was from Lucha Blog. Let's see. God, it's probably the same tweet that I was talking about. Yeah, because uh, Lucha Blog was talking about, you know, they could potentially find another female little guy to team up with Teton. Um, and just the them having no power over Mexican bookings for either of those guys. Uh, the tag league feel hasn't been announced officially yet. 
but then he he retweeted later and said that he was told that there's nothing to worry about um, regarding this matchup here for the crash. Well, part of what I, I don't know if you heard, um, but Sophia Alonso's out. I heard that I, I heard that there was potential of her being out as she wasn't officially out yet. Yeah, so I guess I guess like, and this is just kind of secondhand what I heard on Wrestling Observer this uh, earlier today from this uh, from the reporting this past weekend on his um, on his podcast. Basically, uh, Conan had said that she is planning to do something completely different, um, separate from um, CMLL altogether, and that he said she already is out of power, even though it's not, like, officially announced. He was like, she's out of power already. But I did hear that she, she owns a lot of the trademarks. Yeah, so that's one of the interesting things to, uh, to this story is that they when they've trademarked a lot of those wrestler names, a lot of that intellectual property were, were held by the Alonzo family, and not necessarily CMLL, including potentially the name CMLL might even be owned as intellectual property by their family and not by the company itself. Hmm. Um, or even EMLL because, you know, that's the original, the original name. name. Yeah. Um, so it's very, very interesting stuff there. I mean... Um, and I know uh, Roosh said that he would go with Sophia Alonza if she does start something. Right, right. And so there are rumors that she already is in the process of doing this. Um as we speak so who knows what's really happening there but you know it's kind of what you touched on the the big deal is that they're saying that they don't want um you know essentially i guess one of the things that was, were happening this weekend is they're saying that like the shows that dragon lee and roosh work on that cmll wrestlers can't work on it right that's what happened with this crash show. right they called and said you got you got to pull either you cancel dragon lee or roosh or we're pulling our guys that would seem to me there's a good possibility that if that's the case, that he's probably maybe not going to be on the Junior Tag League. And if he is, he's, he's not teaming not with, team, team with Teton. Teton. Yeah. Like, I can't see that happening now with the way things are going unless, like, New Japan just wants to throw their weight around. And maybe they can do that. I don't know if they can or not. Like, I don't know what the inner workings with these two companies are. But um, it's pretty precarious. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very precarious. Well, that's going to wrap things up for the news. And then before we head out, the recommended match of the week. Young boy, it's your turn for the recommended match of the week. So we're going back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm throw I'm giving you a way, way, way back, and it's a hidden gem. It's something that a lot of people haven't seen, a lot of people haven't heard of. But I'm telling you, if you go out of your way to watch this, you will be rewarded greatly. The date, April 1st. 1982, the competitors, the original Tiger Mask taking on Steve Wright. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Steve Wright, the father of one dancing Alex Wright. Das Wander Kid. Das Wander Kid, better known as uh, Berlin. Um, <laughs> if Some of you who are fans of um, World of Sport might know Steve Wright better by the name of Bull Blitzer. He was uh, one of the German heavyweight champions in that, in that uh, time frame. But... Um, Listen, guys, I'm telling you, this match is extremely underrated. It's something that a lot of people don't know about. Tiger Mask, for his time, one of the hallmarks about him was that he was so innovative with his, you know, athleticism and his, um, you know, just every, like his innovation and when it came to wrestling, his high-flying style and all that. If you want to see somebody come into his house and freaking school him, you need to see this match. Steve Wright's doing stuff in 1982 that you probably thought he's doing like PWG and like <laughs> like early 2000s like ROH chain stuff. Chain wrestling. He's doing like high, 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 high level chain wrestling. Like it's one of the things I love about the world of sports style. A lot of people don't, you know, they they when they try to watch world sport, they kind of get bored with it. But there's there are these guys out there from the early 80s and late 70s that were doing the stuff that you like from the 90s that you think are so innovative from, like, the J-Cup and all that. But really, these guys in Europe were doing it back in the late 70s and 80s, and Steve Wright was a master of it. And he comes to Japan, and he's he out, left, he out athleticisms Tiger Mask. The, the whole first half of the match is him just hitting every single freaking cool and interesting, like, high, like, like chain grappling high spot that you've ever seen. 
Um, it's hard to kind of describe what I'm talking about, but this match is available on New Japan World. And for those of you who don't have it, it's also available online. Uh, so you can find it. It's out there, and it's it's a really compelling watch. Um, the crowd's not super into it. It is an undercard match, and it, um, you know, Steve Wright's not a guy that they're super familiar with. The match has kind of a not a great ending. It is a clean finish, though. Um, most Tiger Mask matches did have clean finishes, but um, this was really cool just to kind of see somebody. In most matches, Tiger Mask kind of like out dazzled most of his competitors and tended to eat them alive. Steve Wright eats Tiger Mask alive in this match. So go out of your way, expand your wrestling knowledge, expand your knowledge of the juniors in, in New Japan Pro Wrestling. Watch Steve Wright versus Tiger Mask. You won't be disappointed. Nice. Well, that's going to wrap things up for this week of Keeping a Strong Style. Next week, we'll be back to review King of Pro Wrestling. Like we mentioned earlier, the show, it might drop late Tuesday night instead of early Tuesday, just depending on how fast we can watch it and record. So stay tuned to that. And make sure you connect with us on social media. I'm at Jeremy L. Donovan on Twitter. The show is at KI Strong Style. You can also follow us at Social Suplex. On Facebook, we are facebook.com slash social suplex. You can also join us in the Wrestling Squared Circle Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash wrestling squared circle. On Reddit, I am the pro black guy. Josh is keeping a strong style. You can email me, jeremy at social suplex.com. Make sure you check out all the other shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. On Sundays, we have One Nation Radio, hosted by Rich Latta and James Boyd. On Wednesdays, we have the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show from Scotland. On every other Wednesday, we have our podcast dedicated to independent wrestling, Grown Men Watch This Shit, hosted by Jeremy Tate and Chris Bryan. On Fridays, we have Get In The Ring with Danny and Beast Mike. On Saturdays, we have All Things Elite with Floyd Johnson Jr., Amy O., and Tiffany. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next week on Keeping a Strong Style, the ace of podcasts. Slide in our DMs. Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time.